Stone of Tears by Terry Goodkind, continuing on page 539. Her face brightened. You would look handsome in the red coat, Richard winced. The red one? Does it have to be the red one? She ran her finger down the Aegeal, hanging from his neck. No, it doesn't have to be that one. I just thought it would look good on your broad shoulders. Richard sighed. I will feel foolish in any. It might as well be the red. You will not look foolish. You will look handsome, Pasha grinned. You'll see. All the women will be batting their lashes at you. She lifted the Aegeal. Richard, what is this? Just sort of a good luck charm. You ready to go back? I think you need to get started teaching me. The sooner you start, the sooner I get this collar off. Then we'll both be happy. You will be a sister, and I will be free. He put his arm around her shoulders, and she put hers around his waist as they walked back for Bonnie. Chapter 53 On the bridge to Hall's Band Island, in a pool of light under a lamp, a crowd of boys and young men mobbed them. Many were dressed in fine clothes, some wore robes, and each had a Radahan around his neck. They all excitedly asked questions at the same time, wanting to know if it was true that Richard had killed Amriswith and what it looked like. They wanted to tell Richard their names and clamored for him to draw his sword and show them how he had vanquished the legendary monster. Pasha spoke to the most persistent boy at her hip. Yes, Kip, it's true that Richard killed him Riswith. Sister Marin is studying it now, and if she deems it appropriate, she will tell you of its nature. But I can tell you true that it is a fearsome-looking beast. Now, off with you all. It's nearly dinner time. Despite their disappointment that no more information was forthcoming, they were excited by what they had heard. They ran off in a bunch to tell others. After leaving Bonnie at the stables, Richard walked with Pasha down halls and through vast chambers, trying to memorize the layout. She pointed out the boys' dining halls and the dining hall where the sisters and some of the older young men ate. She also took him past the kitchens where the aromas of cooking wafted through the surrounding corridors. Pasha pointed through a lattice-covered archway to a graceful stone wall running under the spreading branches of trees. The wall was veiled in places by vines. Large white flowers dotted the green. That's the prelate's offices and quarters, Pasha said. Will she be at dinner tonight? Pasha giggled softly. No, of course not. The prelate doesn't have time to have dinner with us. Richard turned out of the hall and down a walkway toward a gate in the wall. Richard, what are you doing? Where are you going? I want to meet the prelate. You can't simply go visit her. Why? She hurried along beside him. Well... She's a busy woman. She can't be bothered. They won't let you see her. The guards won't even let us through the gate. He shrugged. It won't hurt to ask, will it? Then afterwards you can pick an outfit for me and we'll go to have dinner with the sisters, all right? The offer to let her pick his outfit gave her pause. Pasha stuttered that she supposed it wouldn't hurt just to ask and struggled to keep up as he marched toward the guard. The guard stepped before the iron gate, spread his feet, and hooked his thumbs on his weapons belt as Richard strode right up to him. Richard put a hand to the man's shoulder. I'm so sorry. Forgive me, please. I didn't get you in any trouble, did I? I hope not. She hasn't come out to yell at you yet, I hope. The man frowned in confusion as Richard leaned closer. Look, what's your name? Swordsman Andalmere. Kevin Andalmere. Look, Kevin. She said she would send the guard at the west gate to get me if I was even one minute late. She probably forgot to send you out. It isn't your fault. I promise I won't mention your name. I hope you're not angry with me. Richard put his back to Pasha and leaned even closer to the guard. You understand. He rolled his eyes meaningfully toward Pasha and then gave the man a wink. Kevin glanced to Pasha as she fussed with her tangled mat of hair. Eh? You understand, I'm sure. Look, Kevin... Say you'll let me buy you an ale, will you? I better get in there before I get you in trouble. But before I go, promise me you'll let me buy you an ale to make it up to you. Well, I suppose I could let you buy me an ale. Richard clapped Kevin on the shoulder. There's a good man. Pasha was right on Richard's heels as he stormed past the guard and through the gate. He turned and gave Kevin a wave and a smile. Pasha leaned close. How did you do that? No one gets through the prelate's guards. Richard held the door into the building open for her. I just gave him too much to think about and a worry he feared might be true. When an answer came to her knock, they stepped into a dimly lit room with two desks and two sisters. Pasha curtsied. Sisters, I am novice Pasha Mays, 
And this is our new student, Richard Cipher. He was wondering if he might meet the prelate. Both sisters glowered at her. The one on the right spoke. The prelate is busy, dismissed, novice. A little pale, Fasha curtsied again. Thank you for your time, sisters. Richard gave a little bow. Yes, thank you, sisters. Please give the prelate my kindest regards. I told you she wouldn't see us, Fasha said on the way out. Richard hiked his pack up higher on his shoulder. Well, we gave it our best try. Thanks for indulging me. He had known that Pasha had been right, that the prelate wouldn't see them, but he had seen what he had come to see. He had only been interested in knowing the layout of the building and grounds for future reference. Richard hadn't changed his mind about his captivity, but he had decided to try a different approach for a while. He would bide his time and see what they could teach him. Nothing would please him more than to be released from the collar without having to hurt anyone. In the building that housed his room, Gillom Hall, named after a prophet, Richard had learned, a young man came hesitantly out of the shadows on the lower level before the wide marble stairs. His head of curly blonde hair was cut short at the sides. His hands were stuck into the opposite sleeves of his violet robes. Silver brocade circled the cuffs and neck. He looked smaller than he was because of the way he hunched over. His head bowed to Pasha while his blue eyes searched for a safe place to settle. Blessings on you, Pasha, he said softly. You look lovely tonight. I pray you are well. Pasha squinted in thought. Warren, isn't it? His head bobbed, surprised she knew his name. I'm fine, Warren. Thank you for asking. This is Richard Cipher. Warren smiled shyly at Richard. Yes, I saw you before the sisters yesterday. I suppose you too want to know about the Mriswith, Pasha said with a sigh. Mriswith? Richard killed a Mriswith. Isn't that what you wanted to ask about? Really? A Mriswith? No. He turned back to Richard. I wanted to ask if you would care to come down to the vault sometime and look at the prophecies with me. Richard didn't want to embarrass the young man, but he had no interest in prophecies. I'm honored by the offer, Warren, but I'm afraid that I'm not much good with riddles. Warren diverted his eyes to the floor. Of course, I understand. Not many of the others are much interested in the books either. I just thought that maybe, well, I just thought that since you mentioned that particular prophecy yesterday, that maybe you would want to talk about it. It's a unique piece of work, but I understand. I'm sorry to have bothered you. Richard frowned. What prophecy? The one you mentioned at the end about you being, well, Warren swallowed. The bringer of death. It's just that I don't think I've ever met anyone from the prophecies before. He blinked in awe. Since you were in the prophecies, I thought, well, I thought maybe... His voice trailed off. He looked down at the floor as he started to turn away. But I understand. I'm sorry to have... Richard gently caught hold of Warren's arm and turned him back. Like I said, I'm not very good with riddles, but maybe you could teach me something about them so I wouldn't be so ignorant. I do like to learn. Warren's face brightened. His whole body seemed to swell. When he straightened, he was almost as tall as Richard. I'd like that. I would really like to talk to you about that prophecy. It's a real conundrum. To this day, the argument over it has never been settled. Maybe with your help. A broad-shouldered man in plain robes and wearing a radahan slipped up silently, took a fistful of Warren's robe at the shoulder and moved him aside. His eyes were locked on Pasha the whole time. He gave her a smooth smile. Good evening, Pasha. It will be dinner time soon. I've decided to take you. His eyes glided down the length of her and then back up. If you can get yourself cleaned up and do something with your hair, you look a mess. You better get to it. He started to turn away. Pasha put her arm through Richard's. I'm afraid I have other plans, Jedediah. Jedediah gave Richard a cursory glance. What, this country boy? The two of you going to chop wood or maybe skin rabbits? You're the one, Richard said. I remember your voice. You're the one who called down from the balcony yesterday asking, all by yourself? Jedediah's condescending smile looked to come easily to him. An appropriate question, don't you think? Pasha lifted her chin. Richard killed Amriswith. Jedediah's eyebrows went up in mock wonder. Well, how brave of the country boy. You've never killed Amriswith, Warren spoke up. Jedediah slowly turned a withering glare on Warren. Warren shrank away. 
What are you doing above ground, mole? He turned back to Pasha. And did you see him kill it? I would wager he was alone when he claimed to have killed it. He probably found a Mriswith that had died of old age, stabbed it with his sword, and then bragged to you to try to impress you. He redirected a smirk to Richard. Isn't that about the way it happened, country boy? Richard grinned. You've caught me cold. You have it right. As I thought. He twitched a small smile to Pasha. Come to me later, child, and I'll show you some real magic. A man's magic. Jedediah strode away imperiously and disappeared around a corner. Pasha put her fists to her hips. Why did you say that? Why did you let him think that? I did it for you, Richard said. I thought you wanted me to stop causing trouble and act a gentleman. She folded her arms in a huff. Well, I do. Richard turned to Warren, still shrunk back against the marble mule post. If he does anything to you, Warren, I want you to come tell me. It's me that's the thorn in his pants. If he takes it out on you, you come tell me. Warren brightened. Really? Thank you, Richard. But I don't think he would bother with me. And I'll be seeing you down in the vaults when you have the time. He cast a shy smile at Pasha. Good night, Pasha. So nice to see you again. You look lovely tonight. Good night. She smiled. Good night, Warren. She watched him scurry off down the hall. What a strange young man. I almost couldn't remember his real name. Everyone calls him the Mole. He almost never comes up from the vaults under the palace. She glanced sideways to Richard. Well, you've made a friend tonight who can be of no help to you and an enemy who can harm you. You stay away from Jedediah. He's an experienced wizard, close to being released. Until you learn to defend yourself with your Han, he can hurt you. He can kill you. I thought we were one big happy family. There is a pecking order among wizards. Wizards with the strongest power vie for dominance. It sometimes gets very dangerous. Jedediah is the pride of the palace and does not take well to the idea that another may challenge his supremacy. I'm hardly a challenge to the power of a wizard. Pasha lifted an eyebrow. Jedediah never killed Amriswith, and everyone knows that. Feeling decidedly uncomfortable in the red coat Pasha had selected, Richard tried to enjoy the lentil porridge they had prepared especially for him. Pasha wore a stunning dark green dress that did more to reveal her figure than cover it. Richard thought it revealed more of her breasts than was prudent. The young men there, as guests of sisters or their novices, did little eating and a lot of watching. None missed a move Pasha made. Many of the young men in collars came by and introduced themselves to Richard, saying they wanted to get to know him better. They promised to show him the city and some of its more interesting sights. Pasha's face reddened at the last. Richard asked if they knew where the guards went for ale, and they promised to take him there whenever he wished. Sisters of every age, shape, and size came to greet him. They all acted as if the events of the night before had never taken place. When Richard asked Pasha why, she said all the sisters understood the difficulty a young man had in making the adjustment of coming to the palace. She said they were accustomed to such outbursts of emotion and didn't take them to heart. Richard kept to himself the thought that this time they should. Some of the sisters smiled and said they hoped they would be given the opportunity to work with him, and a few scowled and promised they would be seeing him and promised not to be tolerant of anything less than his best efforts. Richard smiled and said he would give them nothing less than his best. He wondered to himself what he was committing to. Near the end of the meal, two attractive young women, one in a satiny pink dress, the other in yellow, rushed in, stopping at various tables, speaking in whispers to other young women. They at last came to the corner where Richard and Pasha sat. One bent close to Pasha. Have you heard? Pasha stared with a blank look. Jedediah fell down a flight of stairs. Her eyes sparkled with the telling of the gossip. She leaned closer with the titillation of what she had to tell next. Broke his leg. Pasha gasped. No. When? We just saw him a while ago. The woman giggled and nodded. Yes, it's true. It just happened not a few minutes ago. The healers are with him now. No need for concern. He'll be back to good by morning. How did it happen? The woman shrugged. Just clumsy, tripped on the carpet and tumbled down. She lowered her voice. He was so furious, he flamed the carpet to ash. Wizard's fire, Pasha whispered incredulously. In the palace? Such a high crime. No, no, not wizard's fire, of course not, silly girl. Even Jedediah is not that brazen. Just simple fire. 
but it was one of the oldest carpets in the palace. The sisters are not pleased at his display of temper. They ordered the bone and the pain not be mended until morning as punishment. Their gossip finally expended, the two young women's eyes and smiles settled on Richard. Pasha introduced them as two friends of hers, Celia and Dulcie, two novices with charges of their own. Richard was polite, complimenting them on their pretty dresses and the way their hair was curled. Their smiles widened. Taking his arm when they finally left, Pasha thanked him. For what? I've never been permitted to eat with the sisters or with the novices who have a young man to train. This is the first time I've ever been to dinner just like I was a sister. You were pleasant and considerate of everyone. I was so proud to have you with me. And you look very handsome in those clothes. In that dress, I would imagine you could easily get someone better bred than me as a dinner companion. Richard pulled open the fancy shirt collar. I've never worn a shirt this ruffled or white, nor a coat this red. I think I look foolish. A self-satisfied smile spread on Pasha's face. I can promise you that Celia and Dulcie do not think you look foolish. I'm surprised you couldn't see them glowing green. I thought maybe they might decide to sit right down on your lap. Richard thought that if Celia and Dulcie liked the red coat so much, they could have it, but he kept the thought to himself. Why doesn't an important wizard like Jedediah wear fancy clothes? Only beginning wizards wear clothes like this and are permitted to go into the city. At certain milestones in a wizard's advancement, they change to a particular form of dress. The further a wizard's progress, the more modest his dress. That's why Jedediah wears simple tan robes, because he has nearly reached the end of his training. What's the purpose of such an odd rule? To teach humility, those with the nicest clothes, the most freedom, and unlimited money are those with the least power. No one respects them for these things. It's meant to teach the young men that mastery comes from within, not from external trappings. Been wearing these things is a demotion for me. I was already wearing humble clothes. You are not yet entitled to wear humble robes. You may wear your own clothes occasionally if you wish. If they were simple robes, though, it would not be allowed. The people in the city know a wizard's abilities and power by his dress. No wizard who wears simple robes is permitted to go into the city. She smiled. Someday, when you have advanced enough, you will be permitted to wear the robes of a wizard. I don't like robes. I like the clothes I was wearing. When you have your collar off and leave the palace, you may wear what you wish. Of course, most come to respect the robes of their profession and wear them the rest of their lives. Richard changed the subject. I want to go see Warren. Tell me how to get down there. Now? Tonight? Richard, it's been a long day, and I must give you your first lesson yet tonight. Just tell me how to get down there. Will Warren be down there this late? I don't know that he has ever seen anywhere else. I think he must sleep on the books. I was surprised to see him up in the palace today. That in itself will be gossip for weeks. I don't want him to think I forgot him. Just tell me how to get down there. Well, she sighed, if you insist on going, we will go together. I'm supposed to escort you wherever you go in the Palace of the Prophets, for now anyway. Chapter 54 In the core of the Palace of the Prophets, they began their descent down into the vaults. The stairways on the upper levels were elegant. Lower down, the stairs became utilitarian stone, with their leading edges worn round and smooth. The maid servants he had seen on the upper levels were nowhere to be seen. Paneled walls gave way to stone. In some places, he had to duck under huge beams. Lamps were no longer stationed on the walls, but instead widely spaced torches lit the way. Sounds of palace life were left far behind, to be replaced by dead silence. Some of the hallways were wet with leaking water. What's in these vaults? Richard asked. The books of prophecy, books of history, and records of the palace are also kept there. Why are they way down here? For protection. Prophecies are dangerous to the untrained mind. All novices study books of prophecy, but only certain sisters are permitted to read them all and work with them. Young wizards who show that their gift gives them an aptitude for prophecy are taught by these sisters. There are a few young men who work and study in the vaults, but Warren is to the vaults what Jedediah is to other forms of magic. Every wizard has a specialty. We will work with you to discover what your innate ability is. Until we can learn this, it will be hard to take your training very far. Sister Verna told me something about that. So what do you think my talent is? Usually we can tell by the personality of the boy. Some like to work with their hands and end up making things of magic. Some like to help the sick or injured and become healers. 
Things like that, we can usually tell. So what about me? She glanced briefly in his direction. None of us has ever seen anyone like you before. We have no idea yet. Pasha's face brightened. But we will. A huge round stone door, as thick as Richard was tall, stood open in the gloom. Beyond it were rooms carved from the bedrock that the palace sat atop. Lamps did little to brighten the place. There were a number of long, time-worn tables with books and papers scattered about on them, and shelves in rows that extended into the distance to each side. Two women sat at the tables taking notes as they read by the light of candles set close. One of them peered up and addressed Pasha. What are you doing down here, child? Pasha curtsied. We came to see Warren, sister. Warren? Why? Just then, Warren came scurrying out of the darkness. It's all right, Sister Becky. I asked them to come. Well, the next time, please let someone know in advance. Yes, sister, I will. Warren burrowed between the two of them and took their arms, leading them into the shelves. When he realized he was touching Pasha, he jerked his hand away and turned red. You look dazzling, Pasha. Why, thank you, Mole. She flushed red herself. She put a hand to his shoulder. I'm sorry, Warren. I didn't mean anything by that. I meant to call you Warren. He smiled. It's all right, Pasha. I know people call me the Mole. They think it a pejorative, but I take it as a compliment. You see, a Mole can find its way in the dark where others are blind. That is much like what I do. I find the way where others see nothing. Pasha sighed in relief. I'm glad, Warren. Mole, did you hear that Jedediah fell down a flight of stairs and broke his leg? Really? He searched her eyes. Maybe the Creator was trying to teach him that when you hold your nose so high in the air, you can't see where you are going. I don't think Jedediah paid any heed to the Creator's lessons, Pasha said. I heard tell that he was so angry he burned a prized carpet to ash. Warren still held her eyes. You are the one who should be angry, not Jedediah. He said cruel things to you. No one should say cruel things to you. He is usually kind to me, but I admit I did look a mess. Some of these books look a mess to people, but it is what's inside that matters, not the dust on their covers. Pasha blushed. Why, thank you, Mole, I think. Warren looked to Richard. I didn't know if you would really come. Most people say they will, but they never do. I'm so pleased you did. Come this way. Pasha, I'm afraid you must wait here. What? She leaned forward, and Richard thought that maybe her breasts might spill out if she didn't straighten up. I'm going, too. Warren's eyes widened. But I must take him into one of the back rooms. You are a novice. Novices are not allowed. She smiled warmly as she did straighten up. Mole, if a novice is not allowed, how can a new student be allowed? Warren's eyes narrowed. He is in the prophecies. If the prophets saw fit to write about him, they could hardly intend he not see it. Warren seemed considerably more confident down here in his element than he had been up in the palace. He stood his ground with confidence. Pasha rubbed his shoulder. He glanced down at the hand. Warren, you're the mole. You show others the way. I'm the one in charge of Richard. I show him the way. I would be neglecting my duty if I allowed him to go somewhere without me this soon. I'm sure you can make an exception for me. Can't you, Warren? It's to help Richard to help understand the prophecy and how he is to serve the Creator. Isn't that what's important? Warren finally took his eyes from her and told them to wait. He went off to the two sisters and spoke with them in hushed tones. He finally came back wearing a smile. Sister Becky said it would be permitted. I told her you understand a bit of Hai Daharan. In case she asks, say you do. What's Hai Daharan? Warren, you want me to lie to a sister? I'm sure she will not ask. Warren turned his face away. I told the lie for you, Pasha, so you would not have to. She leaned closer to him. Warren, if you're caught telling lies about such things, you know what they will do. He gave her a small, haunted smile. I know. What will they do? Richard asked, suddenly suspicious. Warren waved impatiently. Never mind. You two come along. They had to hurry after him as he scurried off into the darkness. They went past rows of shelves, placed tight together, coming at last to a solid wall of rock. Warren put his hand to a metal plate, and part of the wall moved away, revealing another chamber beyond. Inside the small room sat a table and maybe a dozen rows of shelves. Four lamps made it seem bright inside by comparison. Inside, Warren touched another plate, 
and the section of wall slid closed, entombing them in stone and silence. He pulled out a chair for Pasha and had Richard sit to her right. Finally, he pulled a leather-bound book from the shelves and carefully placed it before Richard. Please don't touch it, Warren said. It's very old and fragile. Of late, it has been getting more use than usual. Let me turn the pages. Who's been using it? Richard asked. The prelate. A smile twitched across Warren's lips. Whenever she is to come down here, her two big guards come first to make everyone leave. They clear the vaults so the prelate can have the place to herself and people won't know what she reads. Her big guards? Pasha asked. You mean the two sisters in her outer office? Yes, Warren said. Sister Ulyssia and Sister Fenella. We saw them today, Richard said. They didn't look that big to me. Warren lowered his voice meaningfully. If you ever cross them, you will think otherwise. They will seem very big indeed. Richard took pause at Warren's expression. If the place is cleared out, how do you know she has been reading this book? I know. He turned to the book on the table. I know. She has been doing most of her reading in this room of late. I live with these books. When someone touches them, I can tell. You see this smudge in the dust? It's not mine. It's the prelate. Warren carefully lifted open the cover, and with both hands giving support, turned the yellowed pages. Richard didn't recognize any of the words, or some of the letters for that matter. On one of the pages that Warren flipped, Richard thought he recognized something, a drawing. It sparked a deep memory. Warren flipped over more pages, finally stopping. He leaned over Richard's shoulder, pointing. This is the prophecy you spoke of. Warren moved around to the right side of the table. This is the original, in the prophet's own hand. Few have ever seen it. Do you understand Haida Haran? No, it just looks like scribbling to me. Richard glanced over the meaningless writing. You said there was argument over its meaning. Warren's eyes had an intense gleam. There is. You see, this is a very old prophecy, perhaps as old as the palace, maybe older. This is the original prophecy. It's in Haida Haran, as is everything in this room. Very few people understand Haida Haran. Richard nodded. So people have only read the translations, and there is reason to believe that those translations may not be accurate. You understand, Warren whispered. His movements became more lively. Yes, yes, you see the problem. Most don't. Most think one thing in one language must mean a certain thing in another. In order to complete the translation, they settle on an interpretation that fits their view of the meaning, but in so doing, they create a conspectus that may or may not be the meaning of the prophecy. But that doesn't take into account possible different meanings, Richard said. So when they translate it, they give it only one version. They can't translate its ambiguity. Warren thrust himself forward in excitement. Yes, you have it. That's what they can't understand. And so they argue over the various translations, as if there is a right way and a wrong way to do it. But this is Haida Haran. Warren's words trailed off. Richard was staring at the pages. The images were drawing him in. It was almost as if they were murmuring to him. He had never seen such words before, but somehow they resonated with something deep within him. His hand slowly reached out, drawn to one of the words. His finger came to rest on it. This one, Richard whispered, as if from a trance. The strokes of the letters seemed to lift from the page as if alive and coil around his finger, the dark lines caressing, fondling with intimate familiarity. Before his eyes, too, floated the image of the Sword of Truth. Warren's white face came up from the book. Brauka, he whispered. That's the word that is the center of the controversy. Fuer grisa ost brauka, the bringer of death. Pasha leaned over. So what's the controversy? You mean those words can be translated differently? Warren made a vague gesture with his hand. Well, yes and no. That's the literal translation of the words. It's their meaning that is in dispute. Richard pulled his hand back. He banished the image of the sword. Death. It has different meanings. Warren practically laid on the table as he leaned over. Yes, you understand. Death is plain as pie, Pasha said. Warren straightened and rubbed his hands together. No, Pasha, not in Haida Haran. The weapon the sisters carry, the Dakra, its name comes from this word. Drauka means death, as in dead. Like if I were to say, the Mriswith Richard killed is dead. Drauka, dead. But it has other meanings, too. 
Drauka also is a word that represents the souls of the dead. Pasha leaned forward with a frown. Are you saying that Drauka in that sense can make it mean the bringer of souls? No, Richard said. He whispered the second meaning of the word. Spirits. The bringer of spirits. Yes, Warren said in a quiet voice. That is the second interpretation. How many of these different meanings to Drauka are there? Pasha asked. Three, Richard thought. Three, Warren said. Richard knew the third. The underworld, he whispered, as he stared at the word Drauka on the page. The place of the dead. That's the third meaning of Drauka. Pale as a spirit, Warren leaned toward him. But you don't understand a Haran? Richard slowly shook his head, his eyes fixed on the page. Warren's tongue darted out to wet his lips. Please tell me you don't have Daharan blood. My father was Dark and Rall, Richard said softly. He was the wizard who ruled Dahara, and before him, my grandfather, Panis. Dear Creator, Warren whispered. Pasha put a hand to Richard's arm as she leaned toward them both. Underworld? How could it mean underworld? Because, Warren said, the underworld is the world of the dead. Her brow knit tighter. But how could it mean the bringer of the underworld? How can you bring the underworld? Richard stared blankly ahead. You tear the veil. The silence echoed around the stone room. Pasha looked from one face to the other. She finally broke the silence. But I was taught that for a foreign word in a prophecy that had different shades of meaning, you had only to interpret it in context. It should be a simple matter of seeing how it is used to decipher its meaning. Warren lifted an eyebrow. That's what the argument is about. You see, in this prophecy, it speaks of things that could pertain to each of the three possible meanings of the word drauka. Depending on which meaning was intended, it changes the meaning of the prophecy. That is why it cannot be interpreted with surety. It's like a dog chasing its tail. The more you try, the more you just end up going round and round. This is why I'm so anxious to know the intended meaning of the word Drauka. If I could know that, then I might be able to decipher the rest of the prophecy accurately for the first time. I would be the first in 3,000 years to understand it. Richard pushed his chair away from the table. Well, as I said, I'm not very good with riddles. He forced himself to smile, but I promised to think on it. Warren brightened. Would you? I would be so appreciative if you would be able to help me. Richard squeezed Warren's shoulder. You have my word. Pasha rose. Well, I guess we'd better get to Richard's lesson. It's getting late. Thank you both for coming. I rarely have visitors. Pasha leading, the three of them went toward the door. As she passed through the doorway, Richard slapped his hand to the metal plate on the wall. The door grated closed. Pasha beat her fists to the stone as the slit had become too small for her to come back through. She shouted for them to open the door. As the stone sealed closed, her words were cut off, leaving Richard and Warren in silence. Warren stared at the metal plate. How did you do that? You are just a beginning wizard. You should not be able to affect a shield with your Han for a very long time yet. Richard didn't have an answer for the question, and so he ignored it. Tell me what you meant about knowing what the sisters would do to you if they caught you telling that kind of lie. Warren's hand went to his collar. Well, they would hurt me. You mean they would use the collar's magic to give you pain? Warren nodded as he took a knot of his robes in his fists. Do they do that often? Give us pain with the collar? Warren twisted the knot of robe. No, not often. But to be a wizard, you must pass a test of pain. They come from time to time and give you pain with the Radha Han to see if you have learned enough to pass the test of pain. And how do you pass the test? Well, I can only imagine that when you can endure the pain without begging them to stop, you pass. They never tell me what must be done to pass. His face had gone ashen. I've never been able to keep from begging them to stop. Once you learn to endure what they give, they give more. I thought it might be something like that. Thanks for telling me. Richard stroked his beard. Warren, I need your help. Warren lifted the sleeve of his robes and wiped it at his wet eyes. What help can I give? You said there are prophecies about me. I want you to study everything about me you can find. 
and about the Towers of Perdition, the Valley of the Lost. I also need to know everything I can about the veil. Richard pointed at the book on the table. There was a drawing a few pages before you stopped on the prophecy. It was a teardrop shape. Do you know what it is? Warren went to the book and turned the pages back. This? Yes, that's it. He remembered seeing it around Rachel's neck in his vision of her and Chase in the Valley of the Lost. An image of Zed came into Richard's mind. His heart thumped faster. That looks like the thing I saw. What is it? Warren gave him a puzzled look. The Stone of Tears. What do you mean you saw it? What is the Stone of Tears? Well, I'm not sure. I'd have to study about it, but I think it might have something to do with the veil, if Drauka could be interpreted to have something to do with the underworld. What do you mean you saw it? Richard ignored the question for a second time. Warren, I also need to know about the Stone of Tears and everything you can find about the people who used to live in the Valley of the Lost, the Bakaban Mana. Their name means those without masters. And about one they call the Kaharan. Warren stared dumbly at him. This is all a lot of work. Will you help me, Warren? Warren looked down, picking at his robes. On a condition. I never get out of this place. Not that I don't like working with the prophecies, you understand. But people think that I have no interest in anything else. I'd like to see the country around the palace, the woods, the hills. He twisted his fingers together. I'm afraid of big places. The sky is so big. That's the other reason I stay down here, because it feels safe to me. But I'm sick of living like a mole. I would like to try going outside and seeing it. Would you... well... Show me the countryside. You look to me like someone familiar with the out of doors. I think I would feel safe if you went with me. Richard smiled warmly. You've come to the right person, Warren. I was a woods guide before all this started. I don't know all the country around the palace yet, but I surely intend to. I'd really enjoy guiding you around. It would be just like old times. Warren's expression brightened. Thank you, Richard. I look forward to seeing open places. I need some adventure in my life. I'll start right away on the things you want, but the sisters give me work, so I must search when I can find the time. And I'm afraid that I must be honest. It will take a long time. There are thousands of volumes here. It will take months just to get a good start. Warren, this may be the most important thing you ever studied. You may be able to save time if you start by reading everything the prelate has been reading. A sly smile came to Warren's lips. I thought you said you weren't good with riddles. That is what I was thinking. His smile turned to a concerned frown. Why do you want to know these things? Richard studied the other's blue eyes for a long moment. I am Fuer Grisa Ost Drauka. Warren, I know what it means. Warren clutched his fingers to the sleeve of Richard's red coat. You know? You know which is the correct translation? His fingers trembled. Would you tell me? If you promise not to tell anyone else, for now... Warren nodded eagerly. No one has been able to figure out which one of the three is the true translation because in trying to justify one, they invalidate the whole. Warren frowned. Richard leaned toward him. They are all true, Warren. What? He whispered. How can that be? I have killed people with this sword. I am the bringer of death in that sense. That is the first meaning of Drauka. In order to prevail against otherwise impossible odds, such as defeating the Mriswith, I use the sword's magic to bring forth the spirits of those who have used it before me. I have called the dead forth, called the past into the present. In that way, I am the bringer of spirits. That is the second meaning of Drauka. As for the third meaning, bringing forth the underworld, I have reason to believe that I may have somehow torn the veil. That is the third meaning of Drauka. Warren gasped. It's very important that you find out the information I ask you about. I don't think I have a lot of time. Warren nodded. I'll try. But I think you put too much faith in me. Richard lifted an eyebrow. I have faith in a man able to break Jedediah's leg. I did nothing to Jedediah. Jedediah is a powerful wizard. I would never dare to oppose one of his powers. Oh, come on, Warren. There are ashes of the burned carpet on the shoulder of your robe. Warren brushed frantically at his shoulder. There is no ash there. I see no ash. Richard waited for Warren's eyes to come up. Then why are you brushing at your robes? Well, I... I was... 
I just... Richard put a reassuring hand on Warren's back. It's all right, Warren. I'm a believer in justice. I think Jedediah got what he deserved. I won't tell anyone. And you must not tell anyone about any of this. I must warn you, Richard. You did a very dangerous thing yesterday when you told all the sisters that you were the bringer of death. That is a well-known and hotly debated prophecy. There are sisters who believe it means you are one who kills. They will try to comfort you. There are others who think it means you will bring forth the dead, call the spirits. They will want to study you. He leaned a little closer. There are others who think it means you will tear the veil and bring the nameless one to swallow us all. They might try to kill you. I know, Warren. Then why would you let them know you are the one in the prophecy? Because I am Fuer Grisa Ostrauka. When the time comes, I will kill any of them I must in order to get this collar off. I had to give them fair warning first, give them the chance to live. Warren touched his fingers to his lower lip. But you wouldn't hurt Pasha, not Pasha. I hope to hurt no one, Warren. Maybe with the information you help me with, I won't have to hurt anyone. I hate being Fuer Grisa Ostrauka, but that is who I am. Warren's eyes teared. Please, you wouldn't hurt Pasha. Warren, I like her. I think she is a lovely person, inside, like you said. I only kill to protect my life or the lives of innocent people. I don't believe Pasha would ever give me cause. But you must understand that if I am right and the veil is torn, then more is at stake than any one person's life, mine, yours, or Pasha's. Warren nodded. I have read the prophecies. I understand. I will search for the things you need. Richard tried to reassure him with a warm smile. It will be all right, Warren. I'm the seeker. I'll do my best. I don't want to harm anyone. Seeker? What is the seeker? Richard slapped his hand to the metal plate. I'll tell you about it later. Warren glanced down at the plate as the door slid open. How are you able to do that? Pasha was standing calmly, waiting, her face making a good effort at not showing her anger. And just what was that all about? Richard stepped through the doorway. Boy talk. Pasha stopped him with a hand to his arm. What do you mean, boy talk? Richard looked into her warm brown eyes. I was twisting Warren's arm, making him tell me about the test of pain. You failed to mention it, so I had to ask him about it. Or were you planning on waiting until you came to do it before you told me? Pasha rubbed her bare arms as if to warm them. I do not do that, Richard. I'm only a novice. Full sisters must do it. Why didn't you tell me about it? Tears welled up in her eyes. I don't like to see people hurt. I didn't want to frighten you about what may not come for a long time. Sometimes the waiting can be worse than the actual experience. I didn't want you to have to wait in fear. Oh. Richard let out a long breath. Well, I guess that's a good reason. I apologize, Pasha, for what I was thinking of you. She forced a smile. Shall we go start your lessons? Above ground again, they passed down halls and through several buildings until they finally reached Gillom Hall, where his room was. The fabric of Pasha's dress made a swishing sound as they climbed the wide marble stairway. The walls and columns were a matching tan, variegated marble. It was a beautiful place with elegant rooms, but it was not as impressive as the People's Palace in Dahara. Before he had seen that magnificent edifice, he would have been astonished by the opulence of this place. Now he simply noted its layout in reference to everything else. Upstairs, as they went down another wide carpeted hall, he saw several other young men wearing Radahan. At last, they reached his room. Richard caught her wrist as she reached for the door handle. She looked up in puzzlement. There's someone inside, he said. Chapter 55 It is my job to watch over you, Pasha said. She used her Han, breaking his hold on her wrist and throwing him aside, as if with an invisible hand, and then charred through the door. Richard rolled, finishing on his feet, drew his sword, and flew in after her. Only the small flames from the hearth gave light to the otherwise dark room. They both stumbled to a halt in the near darkness. A voice came from a chair beside the fire. Expecting a wrist with, Richard? Sister Verna. Richard slid his sword back into its scabbard. What are you doing here? She rose to her feet and swept her hand in the direction of a lamp, bringing the wick to flame. I didn't know if you heard. Her face was unreadable. 
I'm once again a sister of the light. Really, Richard said. That's great news. Sister Verna clasped her hands in a relaxed manner. Since I'm a sister again, I wanted to come and speak privately to you for a moment. She glanced to Pasha. About some unfinished business Richard and I have. Pasha looked from the sister to Richard. Well, I guess this dress is, well, not the most comfortable thing to give lessons in. Why don't I go change? She curtsied to Sister Verna. Good night, sister. I'm so happy for you. You should be a sister. And Richard, thank you for being such a gentleman tonight. I will return after I change. Richard stood facing the door once he had closed it behind Pasha. Gentlemen, Sister Verna said. I'm delighted to hear it, Richard. I would also like to thank you for my being returned to Sister. Sister Marin told me what happened. Richard laughed as he turned to her. You've been around me too long, Sister. But you need more practice at telling lies. You're not yet totally convincing. She couldn't keep a small smile from coming to her lips. Well, Sister Marin told me that she had prayed for guidance and decided I would serve the Creator best if I were a sister in view of my experience. She lifted an eyebrow. Poor Sister Marin. Lying seems to have become infectious since you arrived here. He shrugged. Sister Marin did what was right. I think your Creator would be pleased with the outcome. I heard that you killed Amris with. News spreads through the palace like a blaze through dry grass. Richard walked to the hearth. He leaned on the dark granite mantle and stared into the flames. Well, I had no choice. Sister Verna stroked a hand tenderly down his hair. Are you all right, Richard? How are you doing? I'm fine. Richard pulled the baldric over his head and set it and the sword aside. He tossed the red coat on a chair. I'd be better if I didn't have to wear these silly clothes. But I guess it's a small price to pay for peace. For now... What did you want to talk to me about, sister? I don't know what you did, how you got me returned to sister, but thank you, Richard. Does this mean you would like for us to be friends? Only if you will take this collar off me. She looked away from his eyes. Someday, sister, you will have to make your choice. I hope when the time comes, you choose to be on my side. After all we've been through, I would hate to have to kill you, but you know what I am capable of. You knew what my answer would be. Surely you came here for more than that. I have told you before how you are using your Han without knowing what you are doing, remember? Yes, but I don't think I'm using my Han. She lifted an eyebrow. Richard, you killed Amris with. As far as I know, that has not been done in the last 3,000 years. You had to use your Han to do that. No, sister, I used the magic of the sword to kill it. Richard, I have observed you and learned a little about both you and your sword. The reason no one has ever been able to kill Amris with is because they never knew it was coming. Even the Han of sisters and wizards could not sense its approach. Your sword may have killed the Amris with, but your Han let you know it was coming. You are calling on your gift, but without control. Richard was tired. He didn't feel like arguing, so he didn't. He flopped into a plush chair. He remembered the way he had seen the Mriswith in his mind, had seen it coming. I don't understand what I'm doing, sister. The Mriswith came, and I protected myself. She sat in a chair opposite. Look at it this way, Richard. You killed a beast as deadly as anything walking the land, yet that little girl with the big brown eyes and about as much power compared to you as a sparrow compared to a hawk just used her Han to throw you down the hall. I hope you will study hard so you may learn to control your Han. You need to get it under control. She looked at him intently. Why did you go into the Hagen Woods after I told you that they are dangerous? The real reason, not the justification, but the deep down inside reason. Please tell me the truth, Richard. Richard stretched back, looking up at the ceiling. He finally conceded with a nod. It was like something drew me in. It was a need, a hunger. It was like I needed to pound my fist against a wall. And that was the way to do it. He thought she might launch into a lecture, but she didn't. Her tone was sympathetic. Richard, I've been talking to a few friends of mine. None of us knows everything about the magic of the palace, and especially the Hagen Woods. But there is reason to believe that the Hagen Woods were placed there specifically for certain wizards. Richard studied her quiet expression, the creases in her face, the sincerity in her eyes. 
Are you saying, sister, that if I need to pound my fist against the wall, maybe I should do so? She gave a slight lift to her eyebrows. The Creator gave us hunger so we would eat, because eating is necessary. What would be the purpose of a hunger like mine? She shook her head. I don't know. For a second time in as many days, the prelate has declined to grant me an audience. But I'm going to try to find some answers. In the meantime, just please don't let the sun set on you in the Hagen Woods. Is this what you came to tell me, sister? She looked away and paused, rubbing her forehead with two fingers. She looked uncertain. He had never seen her like this. Richard, there are things going on that I don't understand, and they are connected to you. Events are not happening as they should. She saw his curious look. I can't talk about them just yet. She cleared her throat. Richard, I don't want you to trust every one of the sisters. Richard lifted an eyebrow. Sister, I trust none of you. That brought a short-lived smile to her face. For now... That would be best. That was what I wanted to tell you. I'm going to find the answers, but for now, well, let's just say that I know you will do as you must to stay safe. After Sister Verna left, Richard thought about what she had said, and about the things Warren had told him. Mostly, he thought about the Stone of Tears. It puzzled him that the magic in the Valley of the Lost would present him with a vision of something he had never seen before and put it around Rachel's neck. The other visions seemed to have been anchored in his longings and fears. Maybe because he missed seeing his friend, Chase, he saw the vision of Rachel, too. She would be with Chase. But why would the vision put around her neck something he had never seen before, which turned out to look like a drawing in a book? Maybe they weren't the same thing. He told himself they couldn't be, but an uneasy feeling inside said otherwise. As much as he missed Chase and Rachel, it was the stone around Rachel's neck that had captured his attention. It was as if Rachel were bringing it to him for Zed, and Zed had been there with him, urging him to take the stone. Pasha's knock at the door brought him out of his brooding. She was wearing a plain brownish-gray dress with small pink cloth buttons up the front, all the way up to her neck. Though it didn't show the expanse of flesh the green dress had, it was tailored so that it revealed nearly every detail of her shape. The fact that it covered everything only made what it covered all that much more intriguing. The color somehow brought out the softness of her brown hair. Pasha sat cross-legged on the floor on the blue and yellow carpet in front of the fireplace. She draped her dress carefully over her knees and then looked up. Here, sit like me, in front of me. Richard sat on the floor and folded his legs. She motioned him to come closer until their knees touched. She took his hands and held them lightly as they rested across both their knees. Sister Verna didn't do this when I practiced. That was because the Radha Han had to be within the circle of influence of the magic of the palace before we could practice in this way. Until now, when you have practiced touching your Han, it has been alone. Most of the time from now on, I or a sister will use our Han to assist you. She smiled. It will help you progress faster, Richard. All right. What do you want me to do? She told you how to try to reach your Han, how to concentrate on finding that place within yourself? Richard nodded. That is what I want you to do. While you search for that place, I will use my Han through the Radha Han to try to guide you. Richard squirmed a little, getting more comfortable. Pasha took back a hand and fanned her face. This dress seems so warm after wearing the other. She unbuttoned the top five buttons of her dress and then took his hand up again. Richard glanced at the fire to check the logs so he would know how long it had been when he opened his eyes again. He could never seem to judge the time while he searched for his Han. It always seemed like mere minutes, but it was usually at least an hour. Richard closed his eyes. He brought forth the image of the Sword of Truth on a plain background. As the quiet settled over him, as he sought the peace within, his breathing slowed. He took a long breath, and then let himself sink into the calm center. He was aware of Pasha's hands holding his, of her knees touching his, and of her even breathing coming into harmony with his. It felt good to have her holding his hands. He didn't feel isolated the way he had always felt before. He didn't know if she really was using the magic of his collar to go with him, but he felt himself spiraling deeper than he had before. He drifted in the timeless place without thinking, without effort or worry. Whatever his Han was, 
He didn't see or feel anything he hadn't seen or felt before. Other than feeling more relaxed than before, and the comforting feeling of having Pasha with him, it was no different. He was dimly aware of his body starting to feel cramped, and of the warmth from the fire. The cold steel of the sword seemed to be a core of ice in the heat. At last he opened his eyes. Pasha opened her eyes with him. Richard glanced to the fire. The logs had been reduced to glowing coals. Two hours, he judged. A trickle of sweat ran down Pasha's neck. My, but it's warm tonight. She unbuttoned buttons, a lot of buttons. More of her was showing than had shown in the green dress. Richard made himself look back up into her soft eyes. Pasha gave him a small, self-assured smile. I didn't feel anything, Richard said. I didn't sense my Han. Although I don't know what it is I'm supposed to sense. I didn't either, and I should have. Strange. She sighed to herself with a puzzled expression. Her face brightened. But it takes practice. Did you feel my Han? Was it any help? No, he admitted. I didn't feel anything. She made a little quirk with her mouth as she frowned. You didn't feel anything of me? He shook his head. Well, close your eyes and try again. It was late, and Richard didn't want to practice anymore. It was tiring, but he decided to do as she wished. He closed his eyes. He concentrated on trying to bring back the sword. Suddenly, he felt Pasha's full lips against his. His eyes opened as she pressed against him. Her eyes were closed, her brow wrinkled. She grasped his face with her hands. Richard gripped her shoulders and pushed her away. She opened her eyes and licked her lips. She smiled coyly. Did you feel that? I felt it. She hooked an arm around his neck. Apparently not enough. Richard gently put a hand against her as she tried to lean in. He didn't want to embarrass her, so he tried to keep his voice pleasant. Pasha, don't. She rubbed her free hand around on his stomach. It's late. No one will be around. If it will make you feel more comfortable, I'll shield the door. You shouldn't worry. I'm not worried. I just don't want to. She looked a bit hurt. You do not think I am pretty enough? Richard didn't want to offend her, and he didn't want to make her angry, but he didn't want to encourage her either. It's not that, Pasha. You're very attractive. It's just that she unbuttoned another little button. Richard reached out and took a hold of her hand to stop her. He realized the situation was becoming hazardous. She was his teacher. If he angered or humiliated her, things could become dangerously complicated. He had things to do and couldn't afford to turn her antagonistic. She pulled her dress up her legs and put his hand against her thigh. You like this better? She asked in a breathy voice. Richard froze at the firm, sensual feel of her flesh. He remembered what Sister Verna had said that he would soon find another pair of pretty legs. These were certainly that, and Pasha was leaving precious little to the imagination. He pulled his hand away. Pasha, you don't understand. I think you're a beautiful young woman. Her eyes fixed on his face as she ran her fingers down his beard. I think you're the most handsome man I've ever seen. No, you don't. I love your beard. Don't ever cut it off. I think a wizard should have a beard. Richard remembered the time Zed had used additive magic to grow a beard and teach him a lesson, and then had shaved it off, explaining he couldn't make it vanish with magic because that would take subtractive magic, and wizards didn't have subtractive magic. Subtractive magic was of the underworld. He caught her wrist and pulled her hand away from his face. To Richard, his beard was a symbol of his captivity. It meant he was a prisoner. Prisoners don't shave. That was what he had told Sister Verna but he didn't think now was the time to explain that to Pasha. She kissed his neck. Somehow he was unable to stop her. Her lips were so soft and he could hear her insistent breath close to his ear. It felt as if the kiss went all the way through him down to his toes, something like the feeling he had had when she had put her hands to his Radahan. The tingling numbed his brain. Inside he groaned. His resistance was being dissolved by her kisses. When he had been held in a collar by Denna, he had had no choice. Not even death could rescue him from whatever Dana wanted, but he still felt shame for what he had done. He was in a collar again, and Pasha was using some sort of magic on him, but he knew that this time he had a choice in the matter. He forced himself to hunch his head and get her lips from him. He gently pushed her back. Pasha, please. She straightened a little. What's her name, this girl you love? 
Richard didn't want to tell her Kalen's name. It was his life. It was private. These people were his captors, not his friends. That's not important. That's not the issue. What does she have that I don't? Is she prettier than me? You are a girl, Richard thought, and she is a woman. But he couldn't say that. You are a pretty candle, he thought, and Kalen is the sunrise. But he couldn't say that either. If he spurned Pasha, he would have war on his hands. He had to get out of this without making her feel resentful or rejected. Pasha, I am honored, I am flattered, I really am. But you have only known me a day. We've really just met. Richard, the Creator gives us urges and pleasure from acting on them, so we will come to know his beauty through his creation. There is nothing wrong with this. It is a beautiful thing. He also gave us a mind to decide what is right and what is wrong. Her chin lifted just a little. Right and wrong? If she loved you, she would be with you. She wouldn't have let you go. That's what is wrong. She thinks you aren't good enough for her. She must wish to be free of you. If she cared, she would have kept you with her. She's gone. I'm here and I care. I would fight to keep you. Did she fight? Richard's mouth opened, but no words came through the hurt. He felt as if his will to go on had drained right out of him, leaving nothing but a hollow dead shell. Pasha reached out and touched his cheek. You'll see that I care, Richard. I care more than she does. You'll see. It's right if a person cares as I do. Her brow creased in worry. Unless you think I'm unattractive, is that it? You've seen many women, and you think that in comparison I'm ugly? Richard cupped a hand to the side of her face. Pasha, you are ravishing. It's not that. He swallowed the dryness, trying to make his words sound sincere. Pasha, could you just give me some time? It's simply too soon. Can you understand? Could you really care for a man who would forget his feelings so easily? Could you just give me some time? She wrapped her arms around him and laid her head against his chest. I knew yesterday, when you held me so tenderly, that it was another sign that the Creator had sent you to me. I knew then that I would never want another. Since I'll be yours forever, I can wait. We have almost nothing but time. We have all the time you could possibly want. You'll see that I'm the one for you. You just tell me when you are ready, and I'll be yours. Richard sighed as he closed the door behind her. He leaned his back against the door, thinking. He didn't like deceiving Pasha, letting her think that with time he could come to feel differently about her, but he had had to do something. How shallow could Pasha's understanding of people be for her to think that one could win love by invoking lust? He took out the lock of Kalin's hair, spinning it in his fingers as he watched it. The things Pasha had said about Kalin not fighting for him made him angry. Pasha could never know the struggles he and Kalin had been through, the hardships they had had to overcome, the anguish they had suffered together, the battles they had fought together. Pasha probably couldn't conceive of a woman of Kalin's intelligence, strength, and courage. Kalin had indeed fought for him. She had more than once selflessly risked her life for him. What could Pasha know of the terrors Kalin had bravely faced and conquered? Pasha wasn't woman enough to serve Kalin tea. He stuffed the lock of hair back into his pocket. He forced his thoughts of Kalin from his mind. He couldn't endure the pain. He had other things to do. Going into the bedroom, he positioned the ash-framed standing mirror and then retrieved his pack from the corner. Richard pulled out the black Mriswith cape. He threw it around his shoulders and stood inspecting his image in the mirror. It looked like a normal cape. He thought it quite handsome, actually. The cut and length was right. The Mriswith had been about his size. The heavy fabric was inky black, almost as black as a nightstone that Addie had given him to help him across the pass. Almost as black as the boxes of Orden, almost as black as eternal death. But the pleasing cut of the cape was not what intrigued him. Richard moved back against the light brownish wall. He pulled the hood up, cowling it around his face, and drew the cape closed. As he watched his image in the mirror, he concentrated on the wall he was standing against. In the span of a breath, his image vanished. The cape had become the color of the wall he stood against to such a degree that only if he stared, focusing on the edges of the cape, could he distinguish himself standing against the wall. If he moved, it was only slightly easier to pick out his shape against the wall. Though his face was exposed, somehow the magic of the cape, or possibly the cape's magic along with his own, 
served to mask it too, to enfold it somehow into the concealing color. This explained why the Mriswith appeared to be different colors. Richard moved objects behind himself to discover what effect they had. He stood in front of the wall and partly in front of a chair with his red coat draped over it. The cape produced a blotch of red that did a good job of mimicking the color and shape behind. Though it wasn't as flawless as when he stood before a plain wall, it would still be easy to miss him if he stood still. Movement would distort the complicated images as the cape changed to accommodate new conditions, though it still fooled the eye into missing him. But if he stood still, he virtually vanished in front of anything. The effect at times could be dizzying to watch. When he stopped concentrating, the cape would return to black. This, he thought, as he looked at himself in the mirror standing in a simple black cape, was going to be useful. Chapter 56 As the weeks passed, Richard was constantly busy. He remembered that Kalin and Zed had told him that there were no wizards with the gift left in the Midlands. Small wonder. They seemed to all be at the Palace of the Prophets. There were well over a hundred boys and young men at the palace. From what Richard could discover, a goodly number of the older ones, at least, were from the Midlands, with some even from Dahara. Killing a Mriswith had earned Richard's celebrity status among the younger boys. Two of them, Kip and Hirsch, were the most persistent. They followed him around, begging to hear stories of his adventures. At times they exhibited the maturity, almost wisdom, of old men. At other times they, like all boys, seemed interested in nothing more than mischief. The object of this mischief was usually a sister. The boys never seemed to tire of thinking up new tricks to pull on them. Most of the pranks appeared to involve either water, mud, or reptiles. The sisters only occasionally erupted in anger when caught up in the boys' antics, and even then they quickly forgave them. As far as Richard could tell, the boys never earned more than a stern lecture. In the beginning, the young boys thought to number Richard among their targets. Richard had things to do and had no time or patience for it. When the boys learned that Richard was neither shy nor slow with discipline, they quickly moved on to other targets with their buckets of water. The fact that Richard set limits made Kip and Hirsch like him all the more. They seemed starved for older male companionship. Richard rewarded them with adventure stories, or sometimes when he was going from one place to another and their presence wouldn't impede his progress, he taught them about the woods, tracking, and animals. They coveted staying in Richard's good graces, so when he wanted or needed to be alone and signaled with a finger or a nod, they vanished. Richard let them be around often when he was with Pasha, since he couldn't do more important tasks then anyway. Frustrated because she couldn't seem to find time alone with him, Pasha was somewhat mollified when Richard got her excluded from the boys' list of targets. She appreciated not having her fine dresses drenched or having to worry about discovering a snake in her shawl. Richard occasionally asked Kip and Hirsch to perform little errands, just to test them. He had plans for their talents. The other young men in collars wanted to show Richard the city. Two, Perry and Isaac, who lived in Gillom Hall with him, took him into the city and showed him the tavern where many of the guards drank, and he soon after bought swordsman Kevin Andelmere, the ale he had promised him. Richard discovered that most of the young men spent their nights away from the palace, staying in various fine inns around the city. It didn't take Richard long to figure out why, they were provided money, the same as he, and they were practiced at spending it. They bought themselves fancy clothes, dressing like princes, and on their overnight stays they picked the finest accommodations. There was no shortage of women wanting to share those accommodations. Astonishingly beautiful women. When Perry and Isaac took him to the city, they were always quickly surrounded by attractive women. Richard had never seen women this brazen. Every evening the two men would each select a woman, sometimes several, and buy them presents, maybe a dress or a bauble, and then depart for their rooms. The two told him that if he didn't want to bother with spending time buying gifts, he could simply go to any of the houses of prostitution, but they assured him that those women were not as young or nearly as pretty as the ones who approached them on the streets. They admitted, though, that they went to prostitutes sometimes when they didn't feel like wasting time being sociable for no more than a simple coupling. When he was spotted with a collar, Richard drew women the same as Perry and Isaac did. Richard was beginning to see in a new light what Sister Verna meant about him soon finding another pair of pretty legs. The other two men thought Richard was mad to turn down all the offers. Sometimes Richard wondered if they might not be right. 
Richard asked Perry and Isaac if they weren't afraid of a woman's father cracking their skulls. They laughed and said that fathers sometimes brought their daughters to them. Richard threw his arms up and asked if they weren't concerned about getting some woman they didn't even know pregnant. They explained that if a woman got herself pregnant, the palace would provide for her and the child, even her whole family. When Richard had asked Pasha what was behind such a bizarre convention, she folded her arms across her breasts and presented her back to him while she explained that men had uncontrollable urges and those urges would be a distraction to learning to use their Han. So the sisters encouraged the men to satisfy their needs. That was why she didn't go to the city with him at night. She was restricted from interfering with his needs. She had turned back to him and begged him to come to her with his needs, saying she would see to it that he had no desire to go to other women, or if he did go to the city, to at least allow her to be one of the women he slept with. She told him that she could satisfy him better than any other woman and offered to prove it. Richard was dumbfounded by such talk, to say nothing of the behavior. He told Pasha that he only went to the city to see the sights. Having grown up in the woods, he had never roamed around in a city before. He told her that where he came from, it wasn't right to treat women in such a way. He promised that if he was ever overcome with need, he would come to her first. She was so happy to hear this that she didn't mind when he reminded her that he wasn't ready yet. She had no idea that there were times when he felt so lonely that he was sorely tempted to give in to her. She was unquestionably alluring, and it was sometimes difficult for him to make himself keep her at arm's length. Richard had Pasha show him everything she could of the palace. He had her show him some of the city and take him on a tour of the docks to see the big boats. She said they were called ships because they went to sea. Richard had never seen anything that large afloat. She told him that they brought trade from cities of the old world farther down the coast. Pasha went with him to the sea, and they sat for hours watching the waves or explored the tide pools. Richard was astounded to learn that the sea went up and down with tides all by itself. She assured him that it was not the magic of the palace, but did such a thing everywhere. Richard was spellbound by the ocean. Pasha was content to simply sit with him, but Richard couldn't afford to sit and watch the ocean too often. He had things to do. Pasha wasn't permitted to go with him to the city in the evening, in case he chose to be with a woman. He had to constantly reassure her that that was not why he went out at night. Since it was the truth that he wasn't sleeping with any of the women, he had no difficulty being sincere and convincing her. He did not tell her the truth, however, about what he really was doing. Richard decided that as long as the palace wanted to provide him with money, he was going to allow them to finance their own undoing. He spent the palace's money wherever it would help him. He became a regular at the taverns and inns the palace guards frequented. Whenever he was around, they never paid for a drink. Richard made an effort to learn all their names. At night, he would write down the name of any new guard he had met and everything he could discover about him or any of the other guards. He paid the most attention to those who guarded the prelate's compound and any other place he discovered he was forbidden access. He stopped by their posts whenever he was at the palace and inquired idly about their lives, their girlfriends, their wives, their parents, their children, their food, their problems. Richard bought Kevin special expensive chocolates that his girlfriend favored, but which Kevin could ill afford on his wages. The chocolates earned Kevin favors from his girlfriend. Kevin always brightened at Richard's approach, even when he looked tired from the favors. Richard loaned money to any guard who asked, knowing it would never be repaid. When a few made excuses as to why they didn't have the money to pay back, Richard would not hear their reasons, telling them that he understood and that he would feel bad if they were to worry about it. Two of the toughest, who guarded a restricted area on the west side of the palace, would let him buy their ale, but wouldn't warm to him. Richard took it as a challenge. He finally struck on the idea of hiring them the services of four prostitutes, two each, just to get their attention. They wanted to know why, Richard told them how the palace provided him with money and he didn't see why only he should enjoy it. He told them that since they had to stand up all day guarding the palace, he thought it only fair for the palace to pay to put a lady under them when they lay down. The offer was too much for them to resist. They were soon giving him surreptitious winks when he passed. Once they became amenable to his offers, he saw to it that they had reason to give him the winks on a more frequent basis. As Richard knew they would, the two guards began bragging about their romps. 
when some of the other men found out that Richard had been willing to provide those two with the services of ladies, they pointed out to Richard that it wasn't fair to the others that they should be excluded. Richard conceded that he saw the logic of their argument. He soon discovered that he didn't have the time to handle individual requests. So he struck on an idea. He found a mistress of a brothel open to an inventive business arrangement. He put the establishment on retainer, open only to his friends. He calculated that in this manner he was actually saving the palace money over a piecemeal arrangement. He wanted the men to remember to whom they owed their gratitude, so required they give the mistress the code phrase, a friend of Richard Cipher, before they would be granted admittance. There were no other restrictions. Richard gave the mistress a healthy raise in the retainer when she complained to him that business was steadier than she had anticipated. Richard soothed his conscience about the morals of what he was doing by reminding himself that he couldn't change what people chose to do and that it might save him from having to kill the guards when the time came. In that light, it made sense. One day when Pasha was with him and a man gave him a wink, she asked why. He told her it was because he was with the most attractive woman at the palace. She smiled for an hour. Richard accustomed the guards to seeing him in the black cape of the Mriswith. He kept Pasha happy when he was with her by frequently wearing the red coat she liked best. Sometimes he wore the others, the blue, the dark blue, the brown, or the green. Pasha most liked taking him to the city, but she went for hikes in the surrounding countryside to try to be a part of his interests. Richard learned that the guards were soldiers in the Imperial Order on special detachment to the palace. The Imperial Order ruled all of the old world, but seemed to have a non-intervention policy with the Palace of the Prophets. They never interfered with any sister or any man wearing a Radahan. The guards were stationed at the palace to handle all the people who came to Hallsband Island. Every day, people poured over the bridges to come to the palace. Sisters saw petitioners of every want. Some requested charity, some intervention in disputes, and some wished to be guided in the Creator's wisdom. Others came to worship in the courtyards scattered throughout the island. They viewed the place where Sisters of the Light lived as hallowed. Richard learned that the city of Tanamura, vast though it was, was merely an outpost of the old world at the fringe of the empire. Apparently, the emperor of the imperial order had an arrangement with the palace to provide guards, but not law. Richard suspected that the guards were the emperor's eyes in an area of his empire where he was denied dominion. Richard wondered what the emperor received in return for this arrangement. Richard also learned that in at least one of the restricted areas, the sisters had a special guest who never came out, but he was unable to discover any more. Richard began testing the guard's loyalty to him with simple, innocuous requests. He told Kevin that he wanted a special rose for Pasha that grew only in the prelate's compound. Richard made a point of parading Pasha wearing the yellow rose past Kevin. Kevin smiled with pride. At other restricted areas, Richard used the flower excuse or said that he wanted to get a view of the sea from atop a particular wall. He made sure to remain in sight at all times to reassure the guards and dull their sense of caution. It wasn't long before he had all the guards accustomed to his forays. After a time, he was coming and going almost as he pleased. He was their friend, a trusted and valuable friend. Since he was collecting so many rare flowers from the restricted areas, he used them to an advantage. He presented them to the sisters who practiced with him. They were puzzled as to why he would give them flowers from restricted areas. He explained that he considered the sisters who trained him to be special, and he therefore didn't want them to have just any flowers, but those that were special and artfully obtained. Besides making them blush, this explanation also disarmed an otherwise inevitable suspicion if he frequented restricted areas. Though as near as Richard could tell, there were close to 200 sisters. Only six worked with him. Sisters Tovi and Cecilia were older and as kind as doting grandmothers. Tovi always brought cookies or some other treat to their sessions. Cecilia insisted on combing his hair back off his forehead with her fingers and planting a kiss there before she left. Both blushed furiously when he gave them rare flowers. Richard had difficulty thinking of either as potential enemies. The first time Sister Marissa showed up at his door, Richard almost swallowed his tongue. Her dark hair and the way she filled her red dress made him stumble over his words like a fool. Sister Niki who never wore any color but black, had the same effect on him. When Sister Niki locked her blue eyes on his, he had trouble remembering how to breathe. Sisters Marissa and Niki were older than Pasha, 
his age, or maybe at most a couple of years older. They carried themselves with confidence and slow grace. Though Marissa was dark and Nikki blonde, they seemed to be cut from the same rare cloth. The power of their Han radiated from each, making them almost seem to glow. Richard sometimes thought he could almost hear the air crackle around them. Neither walked, both glided like swans, serene and cool. Yet he was sure either could smelt iron ore with their placid glances. Neither ever grinned. They bestowed small, subdued smiles. And only while looking him in the eye, Richard could feel his heart thumping faster when they did. Once, he offered Sister Niki one of his rare flowers from a restricted area. His explanation of where it had come from and the story of why he was giving it to her flew right out of his head. She took the white rose gingerly between a finger and thumb, as if it might soil her hand, and while her gaze held his, she gave him one of her subdued smiles and said in an indifferent tone, Why, thank you, Richard. What Pasha had told him about boys bringing sisters frogs came to his mind. He never gave either Sister Niki or Marissa a flower again. Anything less than priceless jewels seemed an insult. Neither ever offered to sit on the floor for their sessions. In fact, the very idea of Sisters Marissa or Niki sitting on the floor seemed ludicrous to him. The older sisters, Tovi and Cecilia, sat on the floor, the same as Pasha, and it seemed perfectly natural. Sisters Marissa and Niki sat in chairs and held his hands across a small table. It somehow seemed an erotic experience. It made him sweat. They both spoke with a quiet economy of words that added an air of nobility to their bearing. While neither ever made a clear offer, they managed to somehow leave no doubt in Richard's mind that they were available to spend the night with him. Richard could never pin down anything specific in what they said to confirm the impression, but he had no doubt. Their oblique words left him room to feign missing their intent, and neither ever deigned to clarify what she had said. He prayed that they would never make the offer any more explicit, because if they did, he knew he would have to bite his tongue in half to keep from saying yes. Both brought to mind what Pasha had told him about men having uncontrollable urges. He had never been around anyone who could make him stammer and fumble, and in general make himself appear a fool, as those two did. Sisters Marissa and Niki were the embodiment of pure, unadulterated lust. When Pasha found out that Sisters Marissa and Niki were two of his teachers, she gave a small shrug and said that they were very talented sisters, and she was sure they would help him reach his Han. But her cheeks broke out in red blotches. When Perry and Isaac found out about sisters Marissa and Niki, they both nearly succumbed to apoplexy. They said they would give up all the women in the city forever just to have one night with either. They said that if Richard was ever offered the opportunity, he had to take it and tell them every detail. Richard assured them that women the likes of those two would never be interested in a woods guide like him. He dared not say out loud that the offer had been made. The fifth sister, Armina, was older, a mature woman who was pleasant enough but all business. When he had no more luck finding his Han with her than any of the others, she told him that it would come with time and not to feel disappointed. But perhaps he should try to put more effort into it. Over time, she warmed to him and smiled more. She was surprised and flattered by the special flowers. She blushed at her own blushes. Richard liked her straightforward personality. The last sister, Liliana, was Richard's favorite. Her easy smile was disarming, her plain bony look somehow alluring because of her open, friendly nature. She treated Richard like a confidant. Richard felt relaxed with her, sometimes spending more time than he could afford, talking with her late into the night simply because he enjoyed her company. Though he had no friends among his captors, she came closer than any. When Richard gave her the special flower, she hooked some of her brown hair behind an ear and leaned in. Her eyes were wide with mischief, wanting to know how he had gotten past the guards. She giggled when he told the story he invented of sneaking behind their backs. She stuck each rose proudly through a buttonhole and wore it until it wilted or he gave her another. When he touched her in a friendly way, it somehow seemed the natural thing to do. He found himself laying a hand on her arm in the same manner when he told her funny stories about when he had been a guide. They roared with laughter together, holding their ribs and getting tears. Page 567. Sister Liliana told him how she had grown up on a farm and loved the country. Several times Richard invited her on a picnic out in the hills. She was comfortable and happy in the countryside. She didn't care if she got her dress dirty. 
Richard couldn't imagine either Sister Marissa or Niki setting a foot to dirt, but Sister Liliana would flop right down on the ground with him. She never made an offer to sleep with him. That in itself put him at ease. She never displayed any pretense. She seemed to genuinely enjoy her time with him. When he opened his eyes after a session with her and admitted he felt no Han, she would squeeze his hands and tell him that it was all right and that she would try harder the next time to help him. Richard found himself telling her things he told none of the others. When he confided how much he wanted the Radha Han off, she put a hand to his arm as she gave him a wink and told him that she would see to it that he had his wish, that when the time came, she would do it herself. She said she could understand his feelings and for him to have faith. She promised that if one day he was at the end of his tolerance and he truly could stand it no longer, she would help him. She would remove the collar. But she wanted him to know that she had faith in him and wanted him to put in his best effort to learn to control his Han before she even considered it. She said that other young men tried to forget their collar by betting every woman willing. She told him that she could understand urges, but she hoped that if he chose to sleep with a woman, it would be because he liked her and not because he was trying to forget the collar. She told him not to go to the prostitutes because they were dirty and he would catch something. Richard told her that he was in love with someone and didn't want to be unfaithful to her. She grinned and clapped him on the back and said she was proud of him. Richard didn't tell her that Kalen had sent him away, but he wanted to. He knew that someday, if he could stand it no longer, he could tell Liliana, and she would listen and understand. Because he was so comfortable around her, he felt that if anyone could help him find his Han, it would be her. He hoped it would be her. Richard had had only a brother and didn't know what it would be like to have a sister, but he imagined that if he did have one, she would be like Liliana. The name Sister Liliana had a different meaning to him than was intended. She seemed his soulmate. Still, he couldn't let himself open up completely to her. The sisters were his captors, not his friends. They were the enemy for now. But he knew that when the time came, Liliana would side with him. Richard's lessons with the six sisters took up at most two hours a day. A waste of two hours as far as he was concerned. He was no closer to touching his Han than he had been the first time Sister Verna had him try. When Richard could manage to be alone, he explored the land around the palace and found the limits of his invisible chain. When he reached the farthest distance the collar would allow him to go, it felt like trying to walk through a ten-foot thick wall of mud layered over solid rock. It was frustrating to be able to see beyond without obstruction, yet not be able to continue walking. It happened as near as he could tell, about the same distance from the palace in any direction. It was a good number of miles, but once he found the limit, his world began to feel very small indeed. The day he found his boundary, the limits of his prison, he went to the Hagen Woods and killed Amriswith. His only true solace was Gratch. Richard spent most nights with the Gar. He wrestled with his furry friend, ate with him and slept with him. Richard hunted food for Gratch, but the Gar was learning to hunt on his own. Richard was relieved to learn that. He didn't have the time to be with him every night. Hungry or not, Gratch was always distraught when Richard missed a night. Richard was worried that Pasha would know where he went all the time, by his collar. But quite by accident, he discovered something else his Mris with cape did. It masked from Pasha his whereabouts. When he wore the cape, she couldn't find him by his Radha Han, by his Han. She was puzzled by his blanking out from her sense of where he was, but didn't seem too concerned, offering that perhaps it had an explanation that she would come to figure out one day. She seemed to think it was a deficiency on her part. Richard never offered her the solution. He realized that this was the reason none with the gift ever knew Amriswith was coming. Richard wondered why he had been able to see the beast in his mind. Maybe it was, as Sister Verna said, that he was using his Han. But sisters and wizards knew how to use their Han and couldn't detect the Amriswith. Richard had an easier time when he could go where he pleased, and no Pasha would not know where he was. It saved thinking up explanations. He worried that if she ever discovered the reason, she would destroy his cape, so he hid a second for that contingency. Gratch seemed to be bigger every time Richard saw him. By the end of Richard's first month at the palace, the gar was a head taller than Richard, and significantly stronger. When they wrestled, Gratch learned to be careful not to hurt him. Richard also spent some of his time with Warren, getting him used to going outside. At first, he took Warren out into the courtyards at night. Warren told him that the size of the sky and landscape frightened him, 
So Richard reasoned that night would show him less of the landscape, at least to start. Warren said that the sisters had had him down in the vaults for so long that he thought he just became used to being closed in, but he was tired of it. Richard felt sorry for him and wanted to help him. He really liked Warren. He was about as smart as anyone Richard had ever met. There didn't seem to be anything that Warren didn't know at least a little about. Warren was nervous about being away from the safety of the palace, but was reassured by Richard's presence and the way Richard never ridiculed his fears. Richard was always considerate, never taking Warren farther than he felt comfortable. Richard told him that it was just like after you were injured and had been laid up for a while. It took time to stretch the old muscles. After a few weeks of their nighttime forays, Richard started taking Warren out in the daylight, first just up onto the walls to look at the vastness of the sky and ocean. Warren was always close to a stairway that led back into the palace, so he was reassured by having an escape route close by if he felt he had to go back inside. A few times he did, and Richard always went with him and talked about other things to take his mind away from the uncomfortable feeling. Richard had Warren bring a book outside with him so he could be distracted by reading. Letting Warren forget about the size of the sky helped. On a bright sunny day, after Warren had become comfortable out of doors, Richard decided to try taking him out into the hills. Warren was a bit giddy at first, but as they sat on a rock high in the hills overlooking the countryside and the city, Warren said that he felt as if he had mastered his fear. He said that he still felt uncomfortable, but he felt the fear was under control. He grinned at the vast landscape spread out below, enjoying the sight that for so long his fears denied him. Richard told him that he was happy that he was the one to have been able to guide him out of his mole hole. Warren laughed. Warren said he needed adventure in his life, and this felt like the beginning. As far as Warren's search for information was going, he had been able to find out precious little. He had so far found only a few references in old books that talked about the Valley of the Lost and the Bacaban Mana, but what he found was intriguing. The information made reference to the power the wizards had given the Bacaban Mana in return for taking their land, so that they could someday have their land restored. It said that when the completing link was joined with this power invested in their spirit woman, the towers would fall. Richard thought about Du Shai Lu saying that he was the Kaharan and that they were now husband and wife. That was a linking of sorts. He wondered if over the intervening time, the meaning of this joining could have been taken to mean marriage instead of its original intent. As they sat watching the vast landscape, Warren said, the prelate has been reading prophecies and histories that talk about the pebble in the pond. Richard's ears perked up. He remembered Kalin singing him a song about screelings that mentioned the pebble in the pond. Warren hadn't studied those prophecies before and hadn't been able to piece together their importance as of yet. Do you know what the wizard's second rule is? Richard asked. Second rule? Wizards have rules? What's the first? Richard looked over. Do you remember that night Jedediah broke his leg and I told you that you had carpet ash on you and you tried to brush it off? I was using the wizard's first rule. Warren frowned. You think on it, Warren, and let me know what you figure out. In the meantime, it's important that you speed up the search for the information I asked you about. Well, it will be a little easier now that Sister Becky is sick every morning and won't be looking over my shoulder. She's pregnant, he said in answer to Richard's questioning frown. Do many of the sisters have children? Sure, Warren said. What with all the young wizards around who can no longer go to the city? The sisters help out with their needs so they can study. Richard gave Warren a suspicious look. Is Sister Becky's child yours? Warren blushed furiously. No, he kept his eyes to the city. I'm waiting for the one I love. Pasha, Richard said. Warren nodded. Richard looked down at the Palace of the Prophets and the city that surrounded it needs. Warren, do all the children of men with the gift inherit it? Oh, no. It's said that many thousands of years ago, before the old and new world were separated, many had the gift. But over time, those in power methodically killed off young ones with the gift, so they would have no one to threaten their rule. They also withheld the required teaching. It used to be that fathers taught their sons, but as fewer were born with the gift, and it skipped more and more generations, those who knew the way jealously guarded their knowledge. That's the reason the Palace of the Prophets was created, to help those with the gift, who had no teacher. As time went on, the gift was bred out of the race of man, the way you breed a trait out of an animal. This gave the wizards who held power less and less opposition all the time. 
Now that the trait is so bred out, one born with the gift is exceedingly rare. Maybe only one child in a thousand, fathered by a wizard, is born with the gift. We're a dying breed. Richard looked to the city again, then to the palace. His eyes locked on the palace, Richard slowly rose to his feet. They're not seeing to our needs, he whispered. They're using us as breeding stock. Warren stood, his brow wrinkled. What? They're using the palace, the young men at the palace, to breed wizards. Warren's brow furrowed deeper. Why? Richard's jaw muscles flexed. I don't know, but I intend to find out. Good, Warren said with a grin. I need an adventure. Richard gave him a cold look. Do you know what adventure is, Warren? Warren nodded, the smile still on his face. An exciting experience. Adventure is being scared to death and not knowing if you will live or die, or if the ones you love will live or die. Adventure is being in trouble you don't know how to get out of. Warren fumbled with the braiding on his sleeve. I never thought about it like that. Well, you think on it, Richard said, because I'm about to start an adventure. What are you going to do? The less you know, the less adventure you'll have to worry about. You just find out the things I need to know. If the veil is torn, we're all going to have a never-ending adventure. Well, Warren said with a twinkle in his eye, I found out at least one thing of help then. The Stone of Tears? Warren nodded with a grin. I found out there is no way you could have seen it. It's locked behind the veil. In a way, it's part of the veil. Are you sure? Are you sure I couldn't have seen it? Positive. The Stone of Tears is the seal that keeps the Nameless One locked in his prison of the dead in the underworld. He can rule the souls of the dead there with him, but he cannot come to this world. The Stone of Tears seals him there. Good, Richard said with a relieved sigh. That's great, Warren. Good work. He gently gripped Warren's robe and pulled him closer. You're sure? There's no way the Stone of Tears could be in this world. Warren confidently shook his head. None. It's impossible. The only way for the Stone of Tears to be in this world would be for it to come through the gateway. Richard felt his flesh beginning to tingle. Gateway? What's the gateway? Well, the gateway is what the name implies, a passage. In this case, a passage between the world of the living and the world of the dead. It's magic of both worlds, a passage constructed of magic. The gateway can only be opened with both additive and subtractive magic. The nameless one has only subtractive, since he is in the underworld, so he can't open the gateway. The same way someone in this world could not open it, because we have only additive magic. Bumps were rising on Richard's arms. But someone in this world, someone with both forms of magic, could open the gateway? Well, sure, Warren stammered, if they had the gateway. But it has been lost for over 3,000 years. It's gone. He gave Richard a self-assured smile. We're safe. Richard wasn't smiling. He grabbed Warren's robes in both hands and yanked his face close. Warren, tell me the gateway isn't called the magic of Orden. Tell me the gateway isn't the three boxes of Orden. Warren's eyes slowly expanded to the size of gold pieces. Where did you hear that name for it? He whispered in a disquieted tone. I'm the only one in the palace besides the prelate and two other sisters who are permitted to read the books that call the gateway by its ancient name. Richard gritted his teeth. What happens if one of the boxes is opened? They can't be opened, Warren insisted. They can't. I told you it takes both kinds of magic, additive and subtractive, to open a box. Richard shook him. What happens? His eyes still wide, Warren swallowed. Then the gateway between the worlds is opened. The veil is breached. The seal is off the nameless one. And the stone of tears would be in this world? Warren nodded as Richard tightened his grip on the robes. And if the box were to be closed, that would close the gateway, seal the breach? No. Well, yes, but it can only be closed by one with the gift. It takes the touch of magic to close the gateway. But if one with the gift closes the box, the gateway, then it ruptures the balance because he has only additive magic and the nameless one escapes the underworld. More correctly, this world would be swallowed into the world of the dead. Then how can the box be closed to keep the world separated? The same way the gateway is opened, with both additive and subtractive magic. And what about the Stone of Tears? I don't know. I would have to study. Then you better study fast. Please, Warren whined. You don't mean that you know where the boxes are. You haven't found them, have you? Found them? The last time I saw the boxes, one was opened, about to suck my bastard father into the underworld. Warren fainted. 
Chapter 57 Under the impotent rays of the late day sun, an old woman was spreading wood ash on the ice covering the vast expanse of stairs. Kalin walked past, relieved that the old woman didn't look up to see that the person in the heavy clothes, white fur mantle, and carrying a pack and bow was the mother confessor returned to Aden Drill. She was in no mood for starting a celebration tonight. She was exhausted. Already before coming home to the palace, she had climbed up to the wizard's keep on the mountainside, but the keep was stone cold and dark as death. The shields were in place, though a confessor could enter, but no one was inside. Zed was not there. The keep sat now as the last time she had seen it so many months ago when she had left to find the missing great wizard. She had found him and helped stop the threat from Dark and Rawl, but now she needed the great wizard again. Since leaving the Galean army nearly a month before, she had been struggling to reach Adendril and Zed. Storms had raged for days at a time. Passes had been rendered impassable by the weather and snow, forcing them to backtrack and find alternate routes. It had been a frustrating and tiring journey, but the despair at reaching her goal and not finding Zed was withering. Kalin had made her way through the side streets, avoiding King's Row. The palaces on King's Row housed dignitaries, staffs, and guards of the lands that were represented in Aidendrill. The kings and queens and rulers of those lands stayed in their palaces when they came to address the council. The palaces were a matter of pride for each land, and each was magnificent, although none could begin to compare to the Confessor's Palace. Kalin had avoided King's Row because she would be recognized there, and she didn't want to be recognized right now. She wanted only to find Zed, and failing that, speak to the council. So she headed toward the service area to the side, near the kitchens. Chandelin was out in the forest. He didn't want to come into Aidendrill. The size of the city and the multitudes of people made him uneasy, though he denied it, and claimed only to be more comfortable sleeping outside. Kalin couldn't blame him. After being alone in the mountains for so long, she too was uneasy going into the city, even though she had grown up in this place, and knew its streets and majestic buildings as well as Chandelin knew the plains around the Mud People village. The people everywhere made her feel closed in as never before. Chandelin wanted to go home to his people, now that she was delivered safely to Aidendril. She could understand his desire to be off, but asked him to rest the night and say goodbye to her in the morning. She had told Orsk to spend the night with Chandelin. His presence was wearing, his one eye following her everywhere, his jumping to help her with everything, his constantly standing ready to do her bidding at the slightest indication. It was like having a dog continually at heel. She needed a night away from that. Chandelin seemed to understand. She didn't know what she was going to do about Orsk. A stifling blast of warm air hit her as she went in through the kitchen entrance. At the sound of the door, a thin woman in a sparkling white apron spun to her. What are you doing in here? Get out, you beggar! As the woman lifted her wooden spoon in a threatening manner, Kalin pushed back the hood of her mantle. The woman gasped. Kalin smiled. Mistress Sanderholt, I'm so pleased to see you again. Mother Confessor! The woman fell to her knees, clasping her hands together. Oh, Mother Confessor, forgive me. I didn't recognize you. Oh, good spirits be praised. Is it really you? Kalin pulled the wiry woman to her feet. I've missed you so, Mistress Sanderholt. Kalin held out her arms. Give me a hug? Mistress Sanderholt fell into Kalin's arms. Oh, child, it's so good to see you. She pushed away, tears running down her face. We didn't know what had become of you. We were so worried. I thought I might never see you again. It has been a long and difficult time. I can't tell you how good it is to see your face again. Mistress Sanderholt started pulling Kalin toward a side table. Come, you need a bowl of soup. I have some on now if these feather brains who do what scarcely passes for cooking haven't ruined it with too much pepper. The welter of cooks and help caught the words and kept their heads down, applying their attention to their tasks. The sounds of whisks and spoons on bowls stepped up. Men picked up sacks and hurried away. Brushes worked at pots with greater zeal. Butter hissed in hot pans and bread in ovens and meat on spits suddenly needed checking. I don't have time right now, Mistress Sanderholt. But I have things I must tell you, important things. I know, I have things to tell you too, but right now I must see the council. It's urgent. I've been traveling a long time and I'm exhausted, but I must see the council before I rest. We will talk tomorrow. Mistress Sanderholt couldn't resist another hug. Of course, child. Rest well. We will talk tomorrow. 
Kalin took the shortest route through the immense hall used for important ceremonies and celebrations. Fires in the large, magnificent fireplaces set around the room between fluted columns sent shadows of herself spiraling around her as she crossed the green slate floor. The room was empty now, allowing her footsteps to echo overhead from the intricately urn vaulting with the wave-like sweeping ribs. Her father used to set thousands of walnuts and acorns representing troops all over the floor of this room to teach her battle tactics. She turned down the hall at the far end toward the corridor to the council chambers. In the confessor's private gallery, groups of four glossy black marble columns to each side supported a progression of polychrome vaults. At the end, before the council chambers, was a round, two-story high pantheon dedicated to the memory of heroines, the founding mother confessors. Their portraits, in frescoes between the seven massive pillars ranging to the skylight, were twice life-size. Kalin always felt like a pretender to the post in the presence of the seven stern faces that overlooked the room. She felt they were saying, and who are you, Kalin Amnell, to think you could be the mother confessor? Knowing the histories of those heroines only made her feel all the more inadequate. Grabbing both brass levers, she threw the tall mahogany doors open and marched into the council chambers. A huge dome capped the enormous room. At the far end, the main vault was decorated with an ornate fresco celebrating the glory of Magda Cirrus, the first mother confessor. Her fingers were touching the back of the hand of her wizard, Merit, who had laid down his life to protect her. Together now for all time in the colorful fresco, the two oversaw the mother confessors who followed and sat in the first chair and their wizards. Between the colossal gold capitals of the columns thrusting up around the room, were sinuous, polished mahogany railings at the edge of balconies that overlooked the elegant chamber. The arched openings set at intervals around the room and leading up to the balconies were decorated with sculpted stuccos of heroic scenes. Beyond were windows looking out over the courtyards. Round windows around the lower edge of the dome also let light into the glistening chamber. At the far end was the semicircular dais, where the councillors sat behind an elaborate curved desk. The opulent first chair in the center was the tallest. A clump of men were gathered around the first chair. By the numbers, Kalin judged about half the council to be present. As she strode across long swaths of sunlight on the patterned marble floor, the heads began to follow her progress. Someone was sitting in the first chair. Although not enforced in recent times, it was a capital offense for a councillor to take the first chair, as it was considered tantamount to a declaration of revolution. The conversation hushed as she approached. It was High Prince Phiron of Kelton sitting in the chair. His feet were up on the desk, and he didn't take them down as he watched her draw near. His eyes were on her, but he was listening to a man with smoothed down dark hair and beard, streaked with a touch of gray, leaning over, whispering to him. The man's hands were in the opposite sleeves of his plain robes. Strange, she thought, for an advisor to be dressed so, like a wizard. Prince Phiron lifted his eyebrows in delight. Mother Confessor! With deliberate care, he took his polished boots down and came to his feet. He put his hands to the desk and leaned over, looking down. So good to see you. Before, Kaelin had always had a wizard. Now, she had none. No protection. She could not afford to appear timid or vulnerable. She glared up at Prince Phiron. If I ever again catch you in the chair of the Mother Confessor, I will kill you. He straightened with a smirk. You would use your power on a counselor. I will slit your throat with my knife if I have to. The man in the plain robes watched her with unmoving dark eyes. The other counselors blanched. Prince Phiron pulled his dark blue coat open and rested a hand on his hip. Mother confessor, I meant no offense. You have been gone for a long time. We all thought you were dead. There has been no confessor in the palace for what? He looked to a few of the other men. Four, five, six months? Hand still on his hip, he held his other out and gave a bow. I meant no offense, Mother Confessor. Your chair is returned to you, of course. Kalin eyed the remaining men. It is late. The council will meet in full session first thing in the morning. Every councillor will be present. The Midlands is at war. Prince Phiron lifted an eyebrow. War? On whose authority? We have not discussed such a grave matter. Kalin swept her gaze over the councillors, letting it finally settle on Prince Phiron. On my authority as the Mother Confessor. 
whispering broke out among the men. Prince Firen never let his eyes leave hers. When she glowered at the men who were whispering, it sputtered out. I want every counselor here, first thing in the morning. You are adjourned for now, gentlemen. Kalin turned on her heel and marched from the room. She didn't recognize any of the guards she saw throughout the palace, but then she wouldn't. Zed had told her before how most of the home guard had been killed in the fall of Aedendril to Dahara. She missed the old faces. The center of the confessor's palace in Aedendril was dominated by a monumental eight-branched staircase, lit from four stories overhead by natural light that came through the glass roof. The vast square was surrounded at mid-level by arcaded corridors, their arched openings separated by polished columns of wildly variegated gold and green marble standing on square plinth blocks, each decorated with a medallion of a past ruler of one of the lands of the Midlands. The hundreds upon hundreds of glistening vase-shaped balusters had been turned from a mellow yellow stone that seemed to glow from within. The square newels, made of dusky brown granite, were nearly as tall as she, and each was capped with a gold-leafed lamp. Florid carvings in stone covered expansive panels under the complex bands of dental molding that ran in mitered bands over the tops of the capitals. The center landing held statues of eight mother confessors. Kalin had seen modest palaces that would fit within the space the staircase occupied. The monumental staircase and the room that held it had taken 40 years to build, the expense borne entirely by Kelton in partial recompense for their opposition to the joining of the lands into the Midlands and the war it spawned. It was also decreed that no leader of Kelton could ever be honored with a medallion at the base of the columns. The staircase was dedicated to the people of the Midlands and was to honor them, not those who built it as penalty. Kelton was now a powerful land of the Midlands in good standing, and Kalin thought it foolish to rebuke a people for something their ancestors had done centuries ago. As she reached the central landing, and turned up the second flight toward her room, she saw a phalanx of servants waiting at the top of the stairs. They all bowed as one when her eyes fell on them. She thought it must look absurd. Nearly thirty sparkling combed and buffed people in clean, crisp uniforms, all bowing to a filthy woman in wolf hides carrying a bow and heavy pack. Well, this could only mean one thing. Word of her arrival had swept through the whole of the palace already. There wasn't likely to be a gardener in the farthest greenhouse that didn't by now know the mother confessor was home. Rise, my children, Kaelin said, when she reached the top of the stairs. They moved back to make way for her. And then it started. Would the mother confessor like a bath? Would the mother confessor like a massage? Would the mother confessor like her hair washed and brushed? Would the mother confessor like her nails buffed? Would the mother confessor care to take any petitioners? Would the mother confessor like to see any advisers? Would the mother confessor like any letters written? Would the mother confessor like, wish, want, need, or require a whole list of things? Kalin addressed the mistress of the maidservants. Bernadette, I would like a bath. Nothing else. Just a bath. Two women rushed off to see to the bath. Mistress Bernadette's eyes made an involuntary flick down at Kalin's attire. Would the mother confessor like to have any of her clothes mended or cleaned? Kalin thought about the blue dress in her pack. I guess I have a few things that need cleaning. She thought about all the rest of her clothes, most soaked with blood from one battle or another. I guess I have a lot of things that need to be washed. Yes, mother confessor. And would you like me to lay out your white dress for tonight? Tonight? Mistress Bernadette reddened. Runners have already been sent to King's Row, mother confessor. Everyone will want to welcome the mother confessor home. Kalin groaned. She was dead tired. She didn't want to greet people just to tell women how fine their hair looked all pinned and decorated, or men how fine the cut of their coat was, or to listen patiently to supplications that invariably involved the distribution of funds and always sought to prove that the appellant was in no way seeking advantage, but only relief from the inequitable situation in which he was mired. Mistress Bernadette gave her a corrective look, as she had done when Kalin was little, as if to say, look here, young lady, you have obligations, and I expect no trouble about it. What she said, though, was, everyone has been fraught with concern over the safe return of the mother confessor. It would do their hearts good to see you safe and well. Kalin doubted that. What Mistress Bernadette really meant was that it would do Kalin good to remind people that the mother confessor was still alive and in charge. Kalin sighed. Of course, Bernadette. Thank you for reminding me. People have kept me in their hearts and been worried. Mistress Bernadette smiled as she bowed her head. 
Yes, Mother Confessor. As the rest of the servants rushed off, Kaylin leaned toward Mistress Bernadette. I remember when you would have added a swat on my behind for having to remind me of things. Mistress Bernadette's smile returned. I think you are too smart now for that, Mother Confessor. She rubbed an invisible spot from the back of her hand. Mother Confessor, did you bring any of the other confessors home with you? Will any of the others be returning soon? Kaylin's features slid into her confessor's face, as her mother had taught her. I'm sorry, Bernadette, I thought you knew. They are all dead. I am the last living confessor. Mistress Bernadette's eyes filled with tears as she whispered a prayer. May the good spirits be with them always. Why should they commence now? Kaylin said tersely. They didn't bother to be with Denis the day the quad caught her. The fireplaces in her rooms were all blazing, as she had known they would be, and would have been every day she had been away, month after month. The fires in the mother confessor's rooms would never be allowed to go out in the winter in case she returned. There was a silver tray on a table, with a fresh loaf of bread, a pot of tea, and a steaming bowl of spice soup. Mistress Sanderholt knew spice soup was her favorite. Spice soup reminded Kalen of Richard now. She remembered making it for him, and he for her. After dropping her pack and bow to the floor, Kaylin crossed the plush carpets and went into the next room. She stood idly rubbing her fingers on one of the great polished posts at the foot of her bed, staring, remembering that she was supposed to be here with Richard. The day they arrived in Aidendrill, they were to already have been wed. She had promised him this big bed. Kaylin remembered the joy in her heart the day they talked about being wed and coming to Aidendrill as husband and wife. She felt a tear roll down her cheek. She gasped a deep breath against the hot pain that burned through her chest and wiped the tear away with her fingertips. Kaylin went to the glass doors, opening them out onto the expansive balcony. She put her trembling fingers to the broad, icy railing and stood in the cold air, looking up the mountainside to the wizard's keep, its dark stone walls standing out in the last golden rays of the sunset. Where are you, Zed? she whispered. I need you. He came awake with a gasp as he slid and thumped his head. He sat up, blinking. An old woman with straight black-and-white jaw-length hair was sitting opposite him, cowering in a corner. The two of them were inside a coach. It rolled abruptly, sliding him across to the other side. The woman was staring in his direction. He blinked in surprise at her. Her eyes were completely white. Who are you? he asked. Who be you? she asked right back. I asked first. I... She drew her cloak around her fine green dress. I don't know who I be. Who be you? He held a finger skyward. I'm... I'm... He let out a thin sigh. I'm afraid I don't know who I am either. Don't I look like anyone you recognize? She pulled her cloak a little tighter. I do not know. I be blind. I cannot see what you look like. Blind? Oh, well, I'm sorry. He rubbed his head where he had hit it on the side of the coach. Looking down, he saw that he was wearing fine clothes, a maroon robe with black sleeves that had three rows of silver brocade around them. Well, he thought, at least I must be wealthy. He picked a black cane off the floor, giving its fine silver work a look. He turned and thumped it against the roof in the direction of where the driver must be sitting up top. The old woman jumped with a fright. What be that noise? I'm sorry. I was trying to get the driver's attention. The driver must have heard. The coach slid to a stop and then rocked as someone climbed down. When the door drew open and he saw the size of the man in a long coat sticking his wind-burned face in, he clutched his cane and slid back. Who are you? he asked, brandishing the cane. Me? I'm just a big fool, the big man growled. His deeply creased face softened into a little smile. Name's Ahern. Well, Ahern, what are you doing with us? Have you kidnapped us? Are we being held for ransom? Ahern chuckled. More like the other way around, I'd say. What do you mean? How long have we been asleep? And who are we? Ahern looked to the sky. Dear spirits, how do I get myself into these things? He let out a sigh. You've both been asleep since late yesterday. You've slept last night and all day today. Your name is Reuben, Reuben Ribnick. Reuben, he harumphed. Reuben, well, that's a fine name. 
And who be I? the woman asked. You are Elder Ribnik. Her name is Ribnik too? Reuben asked. Are we related? Ahern hesitated. Yes and no. You two are husband and wife. Sort of. Reuben leaned toward the big man. I think that needs explaining. Ahern gave a sigh and a nod. Your name's Reuben and hers is Elder, but that's not your real names. You told me that for now it would be best if I not tell you your real names. You have kidnapped us. You've knocked us on the head and spirited us away. Just calm down and I'll explain. Then explain before I give you a thrashing with my cane. It isn't worth it, Ahern mumbled to himself. How did I ever get into this? Gold, that's how, he answered himself. Ahern pushed into the coach, sitting next to Reuben. He pulled the door closed against the flying snow. Well, just invite yourself right in, Reuben said. Ahern cleared his throat. All right. Now, you two listen to me. You both were sick. You had me take you to see three women. He leaned closer to Reuben and scowled. Three sorceresses. Sorceresses, Reuben yelped. No wonder we don't know who we are. You took us to witches and had a spell put on us. Ahern put a calming hand on him. Be quiet and listen. You are a wizard. Reuben gawked at Ahern. Ahern turned to Elder. And you are a sorceress. Reuben waved his arms around with a flourish. No, I'm not, he snapped at last. Or you'd be changed to a toad. Ahern shook his head with a grumble. Your power is gone. Well, Reuben asked as he straightened his back, was I a talented wizard? You were good enough to put those cursed fingers of yours to the side of my thick head and put it in my mind to help you. You said wizards had to use people sometimes to do what must be done. The burden of a wizard, you called it. You said helping you was something I would have done anyway, that you were only calling on the goodness within me to hurry my thinking along. Anyway, that and more gold than I've ever seen convinced me to do something I ought to know better than to get tangled in. I surely don't like anything to do with wizards and magic. And I be a sorceress? Elder asked. A blind sorceress? Well, no, ma'am, you were blind, but you could use your gift to see. See better than I could see with my eyes. Then why be I blind now? Both of you were sick. Sick with some kind of evil magic. The three sorceresses agreed to help you, but in order to cure you, they had to... Well, they had to give you both something that would make your magic, your gift, go away. You made me wait outside, so I don't know what they did. I just know what you told me before you went back in for the last time to have it done. Reuben leaned in. You're making this up. Ahern ignored him and went on. The sickness you two had was feeding on your good magic. I don't know the way magic works, and the spirits know I don't want to know. I only know what you told me, the way you explained it to me when you came out and convinced me to help you. You said that in order to help you, the three sorceresses had to give you something to make your magic go away. Only in that way could you two heal. The evil magic wouldn't wither and die and your wounds heal as long as it had the good magic to latch on to, to feed on. So, now we have no magic. Well, I don't know how it all works, but as I understand it, you can't really get rid of your magic. What the three women did was make you forget everything about yourselves, so you wouldn't know you had any magic, so the evil magic wouldn't know either that it was there. So that's why neither of you knows who you are or how to use magic. That's why Elder is blind, Reuben squinted. Why would the sorceresses agree to help us? Mostly because of Elder. They said she was a legend among the sorceresses of Nicobaris. Something about what she did when she was younger and used to live here. Reuben stared at the big man. It has to be true, he turned to Elder. It has to be true. No one could invent such an absurd story. What do you think? I think as you. I think he be telling us the truth. Good, Ahern said. Now comes the part you aren't going to like. What about our magic? When does it come back? When do we remember who we are? Ahern raked his meaty fingers through his shaggy gray hair. That's the part you aren't going to like. The three women said they doubt you two will ever get it back. You may never remember. You may never get your magic back. 
The silence echoed in the coach. Reuben finally spoke. Why would we agree to such a thing? Ahern picked at his fingers. Because you had no choice. You were both sick. Mighty sick, Elder, more than you. She would have been dead by now, and you within another day or two at most. You had no choice. It was the only way. Reuben folded his hands over the silver head of his cane. Well, if that is so, then we had to. If we never remember, we will just learn to be Reuben and Elder and start our lives over. Ahern shook his head. There's a problem about that. You told me that the three women said that if the evil magic finally left you, then you might be able to get your memory and your magic back. You told me that it was imperative that you get it back. You said that there was great trouble in the world that you had to help with. You said that it was a matter of grave importance to every person alive. You said you had something you must do. What trouble? What is it I must do? You didn't tell me. You said I wouldn't understand. But how do we get our memories, our magic back? Ahern glanced to each. It may not come back. The three women didn't know if it ever would. But if it is to come back, it will only come back with a shock. A great emotional jolt or shock. An emotional shock. Like what? Like maybe anger. Maybe if you are angry enough. Reuben frowned. So what? You are to slap me to make me angry? No. You said that you didn't know how, but something like that wouldn't work. You said it required a great emotional shock, but you didn't know what it could be or how to bring it about. You also said that if something did bring on the anger, it would be violent and terrible because of the magic. You said you had no choice, though, because you would die if you didn't do this. Reuben and Elda sat in silence and thought while Ahern watched them. So, where are you taking us? Why are we in this coach? Aiden Drill. Aiden Drill? Never heard of it. Where is it? How far? Aiden Drill is the home of the Confessors, clear on the other side of the Rong Shaddam Mountains. It's a long journey, weeks, maybe a month. It will be close to winter solstice, the longest night of the year before we get there. Seems a long way to go, Reuben said. Why did I want you to take us there? You said you had to go to the Wizard's Keep. You said that it takes magic to get in, but you don't have any magic now, so you told me how to get you in. Seems you were a troublesome child and had a secret way to sneak in and out of the keep without triggering the magic. Reuben drew his finger and thumb down his smooth jaw. And you say I told you it was urgent? Ahern gave a grim nod. Then we'd best be on our way. Just as she had been smiling to people all evening, Kaylin smiled to the woman in an elaborate dark blue gown before her. The woman was relating how concerned everyone had been for the Mother Confessor. Her insincerity was as transparent as the hypocrisy from everyone else. Kaylin had spent her whole life listening to duplicitous people trying to mask their avaricious nature with words of altruism and amity. It sickened her. Kaylin wished that just once one of these people she lived and worked with would have the honesty to admit how strongly they hated her and how it infuriated them that she wouldn't allow them to rape the Midlands and its people for their own benefit. She admonished herself that they were not all like that. Kaylin idly wondered, as she half listened, what this dignified wife of an ambassador would think if instead of seeing the mother confessor standing before her in a sparkling white dress, wearing a choker of jewels worth half her kingdom, she were to see her on a horse, naked, painted white, and drenched in blood as she hacked with a sword at the faces of men trying to kill her. Kaelin decided the woman would probably faint. When the woman finally paused for a breath, Kaelin thanked her for her concern and moved away. It was getting late, and she was tired. She had an early appointment with the council. Seeing herself as she passed a mirror, Kaelin felt as if she had been dreaming for a very long time and had awakened, the same as she was before, the mother confessor in her white confessor's dress at the confessor's palace in Aidendrill. But she wasn't the same as the last time she had been here. She felt a hundred years older. She smiled. At least the bath had been wonderful. She couldn't remember finding a bath so luxurious. She had almost forgotten what it was like to be clean. Near the doorway, another finely dressed lady approached. A twitch of a frown touched Kaylin's brow. The woman's sandy hair seemed too short, out of character with the other women's hair, which brushed their shoulders. But her dress certainly was in character. 
It was a costly-looking black gown, letting her shoulders and a sparkling emerald necklace show. The woman blocked the doorway just before Kaylin stepped through. She dropped a hurried curtsy, her blue eyes darting about as she came up. Mother Confessor, I must speak to you. It's urgent. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I don't remember you. The woman's blue eyes never looked up. They were constantly checking the other people. You don't know me. We have a friend in common. When the woman caught sight of a sour-faced older woman looking in their direction, she put her back to the woman. Mother Confessor, did you come to Aidendrill alone, or did you bring someone with you? I have a friend, Chandolin, who came with me, but he is in the woods to the south for the night. Why? That is not the name I was hoping to hear. She looked up into Kaylin's eyes. You must... Her words trailed off. Her intense blue eyes slowly opened wider. She stood as if turned to stone. What is it? Kaylin asked. The woman seemed to be seeing specters. You? You? The color had drained from her in a sickening rush. The woman staggered back a step. The sudden whiteness of her shoulders against the black fabric of her gown made her look like a spirit in a dress. Her jaw trembled as she tried without success to bring words forth. Her face was a mask of terror. Her blue eyes rolled back into her head. Too late, Kaylin reached out for her. The woman crumpled into a heap on the floor. People nearby gasped. Kaylin, along with others, bent to the woman. Men and women crowded around, murmuring to each other about too much wine. The sour-faced woman elbowed her way through to the front. Jebra! I thought it was Jebra! Kalin looked up. You know this woman? And who are you? The woman abruptly realized who she was speaking to. She flashed a sudden smile and curtsied awkwardly. I am the Lady Ordeth Kandatith de Dakidvich, Mother Confessor. I am so pleased to meet you at last. I have been wanting to talk... Kalin cut her off. Who is this woman? Do you know her? Know her? Her sour expression returned. She is my body servant. Her name is Jebra Bevinvier. I'll have the lazy wench thrashed. Body servant, a man said. I don't think so. I've had dinner with Lady Jebra, and I can assure you she is a lady. Lady Ordeth sniffed. She's an impostor. Then you must pay her well, the man said sarcastically. She stays in the finest inns and pays with gold. Lady Ordeth gave the man another haughty sniff and snatched a guard's arm. You, take this wench to my quarters. I'm staying at the Kelton Palace. I'll get to the bottom of this. Kaelin came to her feet and gave the Lady Ordeth a withering glare. You will do no such thing unless you are presuming to tell the Mother Confessor what to do in her own palace. Lady Ordeth stammered an apology. Kaelin snapped her fingers to the side while holding Lady Ordeth's gaze. Guards jumped forward. Kaelin turned. Take Lady Jebra to a guest room. Have a servant bring her some ginger tea, cold towels for her head, and anything else she wants. I do not want her disturbed by anyone, and that includes the Lady Ordeth. I'm retiring for the night, and I do not wish to be disturbed by anyone either. I have an early session with the council. After I meet with the council, I want Lady Jebra brought to me. The guard saluted and bent to Lady Jebra. When Kaylin reached her room, she was brought out of her troubled thoughts by the sight of two Keltish guards from the Kelton Palace at the doors to her room. When the guards saw her, one of them coolly tapped on the door with the butt of his spear. Someone was in her rooms. Kaylin glared at the impassive guards as she stalked through the doors. No one was in the outer room. She stormed into the bedroom. When she saw him, she froze to a halt. Prince Fyron was standing on her bed with his back to her. He gave her a smirk over his shoulder while he urinated in the center of her bed. When he was finished, Prince Fyron turned while he buttoned his trousers. What in the name of the spirits do you think you are doing? She whispered. He lifted an eyebrow to her as he strutted past. Just letting the mother confess and know how happy we all are to have her home. His coat was open. He smoothed the ruffles on the front of his white shirt as he paused at the door. Sleep well, Mother Confessor. Kaelin yanked six times on the bell cord. Six breathless maidservants met her as she was charging down the hall. You wanted something, Mother Confessor? Kaelin gritted her teeth. Take my mattress and bed covers outside to the courtyard and burn them. The girl blinked. Mother Confessor? Drag the mattress from my bed along with all the bed covers out into the courtyard below my balcony and set them on fire. Kaelin clenched her fists. 
What part don't you understand? The six flinched back a step. Yes, Mother Confessor. They stood trembling, their eyes wide. Now, Mother Confessor? If I wanted it done tomorrow, I would have called you tomorrow. Kalin reached the stairs over Grand Entrance just in time to see Prince Fyron joining the man in plain robes waiting there for him. His dark eyes met hers for a long moment. Guards! She screamed down toward the doors. The men in uniform looked up as they came running. Diplomatic privilege is suspended. If I see that Keltish pig or any of his personal guard in this palace before the council session tomorrow morning, I will personally skin you all alive after I kill him. They saluted. Kalin saw Lady Ordeth in the hall leading to the entrance, watching everything that had just happened. Lady Ordeth. Lady Ordeth was already staring up. I believe you said you were a guest of the Kelton Palace. Get out of mine. She was stammering her goodbyes as Kalin spun on her heel and headed back to her room. She picked up a handful of guards on the way. Outside her rooms, she waited until they were lined up before her doors. If anyone comes into my room tonight, it had better be over your corpses. Do you understand? They all saluted to indicate that they did. Inside, Kaylin threw the white mantle around her shoulders and went out onto the balcony into the bitter cold night. She stood with her back straight near the railing as she looked down on the scene in the courtyard below. She wanted to run, but she couldn't. She was the Mother Confessor. She had to do what all the Mother Confessors before her had done, protect the Midlands. She was alone and had no one to help her in her duty. Tears rolled down her cheeks as she watched flames leap up from her bed the bed she had promised Richard. Chapter 58 The reflections of the Mother Confessor in her white dress rotated around the polished black columns as she marched down the gallery, the Mother Confessor's private entrance to the council chambers. Kalin was an hour early. She planned to be sitting in the first chair as she watched all the councillors arrive. She didn't want them talking among themselves before she was present. She froze to a halt as she threw the doors open. The room was packed. Every council chair was occupied. The galleries were all packed with people. Not only officials, administrators, staff, and nobility, but ordinary people. Farmers, shopkeepers, merchants, cooks, tradesmen, wagon drivers, and laborers. Men and women of every sort. Every eye was on her as she stood before the doors. Across the huge room, the councillors all sat in their chairs. No one made a sound. Someone was sitting in the first chair. From this distance, she couldn't see who it was, but she knew. Kaylin touched her fingers to the bone necklace at her throat and prayed to the good spirits for protection and strength. Her boots echoed off the marble as she strode through patches of sunlight. There was something on the floor before the dais, but she couldn't tell what it was. When Kaylin reached the curved desk, the man sitting in the first chair was not the one she expected. Stretched out on a litter before the dais lay the body of Prince Phiron. His skin was pasty. His arms were folded, his hands laid over the blood-soaked ruffles of his shirt. His sword rested across his body. Prince Phiron's throat had been sliced open nearly to his spinal column. Kalin looked up to the solemn, dark eyes watching her. He came forward from the back of the first chair and folded his hands together on the desk. A quick glance revealed what she hadn't noticed before, a ring of guards around the room. She glared up at the man with the dark hair and beard. Get out of my chair, or I will kill you myself. The room rang with the sound of swords being drawn. Without taking his dark eyes from her, the man gestured with a flick of his hand. Every sword went hesitantly back into its scabbard. You are done killing people, Mother Confessor, he said in a quiet voice. Prince Phiron was your last victim. Kalin frowned. Who are you? Neville Ranson. Still, his eyes did not leave her as he turned his hand up. A ball of flame ignited above his palm. Wizard Neville Ranson. Still, his eyes did not leave her as he cast the ball of flame skyward. It rose obediently toward the peak of the dome where it broke with a pop into thousands of sparkles. Astonished gasps filled the room. Wizard Ranson leaned back and drew open a scroll. We have a great many charges, Mother Confessor. Where would you like to begin? Without turning her head, Kalin's eyes took a sweep of what she could see of the room. There was no chance of escape. None. Even if the man before her were not a wizard. Since they will all be invented, I guess it doesn't matter. 
Why don't we just dispense with the mockery and simply proceed to the execution? The room remained dead silent. Wizard Ranson did not smile. His eyebrows lifted. Oh, no mockery, Mother Confessor. But serious charges. We are here to get to the truth of them. Unlike the Confessors, I refuse to put an innocent person to death. Before we are finished today, everyone here will know the truth of your treason. I want the people to know the full extent of your vile tyranny. Kaylin clasped her hands together as she stood with her back straight. She wore her confessor's face. The people all leaned forward a little. Since it is a long list, Ranson said, we might as well begin with the most serious charge. He glanced down. Treason. And since when is defending the people of the Midlands treason? Wizard Ranson slammed his fist to the desk as he shot to his feet. Defending the people of the Midlands? I have never in my life heard such filth from the mouth of a woman. He smoothed his tan robes at his stomach and then sat back down. Your defense of the people was to plunge them into war. You would condemn thousands to die, to assuage your dread that someone other than yourself would rule and rule with the unanimous agreement of the council, I might add. It is hardly unanimous if the mother confessor dissents. Dissents for her own selfish motives. And who is it that you would have rule the Midlands? Kelton? Yourself? The saviors of all people. The imperial order. A prickling sensation rose up her legs. Kaylin felt as if the whole of the dome overhead were collapsing down on her. Her head spun. She thought she might be sick right there in front of everyone. She forced her stomach to behave. The Imperial Order? The Imperial Order slaughtered Ebenezia. They crush all opposition to steal rule for themselves. Lies. The Imperial Order is dedicated to benevolent rule. They simply wish to put your murderous intents to an end. Benevolent. They raped and butchered the people of Ebenezia. Ransom chuckled. Come, come, Mother Confessor. The Imperial Order has murdered no one. He turned to a man Kalen didn't recognize. Counselor Thurston, has your crown city been harmed by anyone? The jowly man looked surprised. I have just arrived two days ago from the beautiful city of Ebenezia, and they know nothing of their slaughter. The crowd chuckled with him. Ransom smiled petulantly at her. Did you not expect, Mother Confessor, that we would have witnesses to expose your preposterous stories? This is simply a fiction meant to inflame people's fears and stir them to war. Ransom snapped his fingers. A woman in drab, worn clothes came in and stood to the side. Ransom gently told her not to be frightened and to tell her story. The woman told of how her children had to go to bed hungry because she had no money. She said she had been forced into prostitution to feed her children. Kalin knew it was a lie. There was no scarcity of charitable people in groups who would help anyone truly needing it. For the next hour, one witness after another was paraded in, and each told a story of hunger and want, and how the palace would not give them money to feed and clothe themselves, not caring if their children starved. The people in the balconies listened with rapt attention to the sad stories, some weeping with the witnesses. Kalin recognized a few of the people testifying. She remembered Mistress Sanderholt offering them work in the past. She had told Kalin that when they had come in, they scoffed at the things they were asked to do. Mistress Sanderholt ended up having to do many of the tasks herself. Wizard Ranson rose to his feet after the last witness had told his tearful story and turned to each side, addressing the people gathered. The Mother Confessor has a vast treasury and she intended to use it to finance a war against the people of the Midlands who would wish to be free of her rule. She first takes the food from your mouths and the mouths of your children, and then to keep you from thinking about the gnawing hunger in your gut, invents an enemy and starts a war with your hard-earned money, which she has stolen for her already wealthy friends. While you people go hungry, she eats well. While you need clothes, she would buy weapons. While your son would bleed to death in battle, she lounges in the lap of luxury. Then your family members are unjustly accused of crimes. She uses her magic to make them confess to crimes they did not commit to silence their protests against her tyranny. People were weeping. A few cried out with anguish at the last part. Still more angrily demanded justice. 
Kaylin began to doubt that she would be beheaded. This mob would probably tear her apart before she ever made it to the block. Ranson held his arms open to the people gathered. As a representative of the Imperial Order, I direct that the people get what they really need. The treasury of Aiden Drill will be put to its best use. It will be turned back to the oppressed. I direct that every family shall be entitled to one gold piece a month to clothe and feed your children. There will be no starvation allowed under the rule of the Imperial Order. Cheering erupted in the Great Hall. The wild applauding and huzzas went on unabated for a good five minutes. Ranson sat and steepled his fingers while he listened to the celebration. He never took his eyes from Kalin nor she from his. Kalin knew that life's hardships were not that simple to eradicate. She knew that seeming kindness could in truth be cruel. She calculated that the payments would take at most six months to empty the treasury. She wondered what would happen the following month when the money was gone and people would have by then stopped working or planting to provide for themselves. Then there certainly would be hunger and starvation in the guise of generosity. At last, the noise died out. Ranson leaned forward. There is no way of telling how many people have gone hungry or starved to death or died in war by your command, Mother Confessor. It is obvious you are guilty of treason against the people of the Midlands. I see no reason to draw the evidence out as we could for weeks. The other counselors all voiced yeas of agreement. Ranson slapped his hand to the desk. Guilty of the first charge, then. Treason! The people cheered again. Kaylin stood with her back stiff, wearing her confessor's face. Ranson read off charges she could scarcely believe could be read with a straight face. Witnesses came forward and testified to atrocities that Kaylin thought anyone with common sense would laugh at. No one laughed. People she had never met before confided their intimate knowledge of what confessors did in secret. A lump rose in Kaylin's throat as she heard what people thought of her. People repeated irrational fears and rumors of every sort of outrage committed by confessors, and the mother confessor in particular. For her whole life, she had sacrificed everything, as had the other confessors, to protect these people, and the whole time they believed these monstrosities instead. Kaylin thought when she heard a witness testify that in order to retain their magical power, confessors had to dine regularly on human flesh, that there would be laughter at the charge. Instead, wide-eyed people leaned forward and gasped. She had to bite the inside of her cheek to keep from bursting into tears, not because she was being charged with such things, but because people truly believed them of her. Kaylin finally stopped listening. As Ranson listed charges, brought forth witnesses, and the council found her guilty of charge after charge. She thought about Richard. She tried to remember all the moments she had spent with him, all the times he had smiled, all the times he had touched her. She tried to remember every kiss. You think it amusing? Ranson railed. Kalen looked up. She realized she was smiling. What? A woman was standing to the side, weeping into a handkerchief. Kalen blinked at her and then looked up to Ransom. I'm sorry, I guess I missed her performance. The crowd grumbled in anger. Ranson leaned back in his chair with a disgusted shake of his head. Guilty of practicing your confessor's magic on children. What? Are you insane, children? Ranson held a hand out toward the woman, who broke into wild wailing. She has just testified that her child is missing and has told how other women have had their children disappear too and how it is common knowledge that the children are taken so that confessors may practice their magic on them. As a wizard, I can verify the truth of this. The crowd howled with rage. Kalin blinked up at him. I have a headache. Why don't you just chop it off for me? Uncomfortable, Mother Confessor? Uncomfortable that the people would be given the chance to face their oppressor and hear the extent of her heinous crimes? Kalin held her confessor's face to keep from tears. I am sorry only that I have given my whole life to the people of the Midlands. Had I known they would be so ungrateful and believe instead such filth after what I have sacrificed for them, I would have been more selfish and left them to true tyranny. Ransom scowled down at her. You have worked your whole life for the Keeper. The crowd gasped again. That is who you serve. That is what you work for. You offer the souls of your people to your master, the Keeper, in the underworld. People in the balconies wailed with terror. 
Cries of anger and calls for vengeance echoed in the dome. Shaking their fists, the crowd on the main floor tried to push forward, but the guards spread their arms and held them back. Ranson lifted his hands, calling for calm and quiet. Kaelin moved her gaze over the people to each side. I give you to the Imperial Order, she called out in a loud voice. I work no longer to save you. You will be punished for your unthinking willingness to believe these lies. Punished by what your own selfish desires will bring upon you. You will come to regret the torment you have willingly cast yourselves into. I am joyful that I will be dead, so I will not be tempted to help you. I regret only that I have ever shed a tear for your suffering. To the keeper with all of you. Kalin glared up at a smirking wizard ransom. Get on with it. Chop off my head. I'm sickened with this travesty of truth. You and your imperial order win. Kill me so I may be rid of this life and go to the spirit world where I will not have to suffer to help anyone. I confess to everything. Execute me. I am guilty of it all. She looked down at the body at her feet. Except killing this Celtish pig. I wish now that I had killed him, but unfortunately I can't claim credit. Ransom lifted an eyebrow. A liar to the end, Mother Confessor. You cannot even admit the truth of this murder. Lady Ordeth came in, her nose in the air, and testified that she had heard Kalin threaten Prince Fyron only the night before. The council all spoke up that they too had heard her threaten to cut his throat. This is your proof, Kalin asked. Ransom gestured to the side. Bring in the witness. You see, Mother Confessor, we know the truth. One of your former friends wanted to help hide the truth of your ways, and we had to use extreme measures to make her cooperate. But in the end, she did. A shaking Mistress Sander Holt was led into the chamber. Guards stood to each side of her stooped, thin frame. Her face was drawn, her red eyes heavy with dark bags underneath. Her familiar vitality was gone. Swaying slightly, she looked as if she could hardly stand without aid. Mistress Sander Holt held her mangled hands out in fear they would touch anything. All her fingernails had been pulled off with tongs. Bile rose in Kalin's throat. A stern-faced Neville Ranson looked down at the woman. Tell us what you know of this murder. Mistress Sanderholt gazed unblinking up at him. She bit her lower lip, her eyes filled with tears. It was obvious she didn't want to speak. Ranson slammed his fist on the desk. Speak, or we will find you guilty of aiding the murderer. Mistress Sanderholt, Kalin said softly. The woman's eyes came to her. Mistress Sanderholt, I know the truth, and you know the truth. That is all that matters. These people are going to do as they plan with or without your help. I do not want you to suffer on my account. Please tell them what they wish to hear. Tears rolled down her face. But, Kalin straightened her back. Mistress Sanderholt, as mother confessor, I command you to testify against me. Mistress Sanderholt gave her a twitch of a smile. She turned her face up to the council. I saw the mother confessor sneak up behind Prince Fyron. She cut his throat before he knew she was there. She offered him no chance to defend himself. Ranson smiled down and nodded. Thank you, Mistress Sanderholt. And you were her friend. But you came forward and agreed to testify because you wanted the council and the people to know the truth? More tears streamed down. Yes. Though I loved her, I had to tell the people the truth of her murderous ways. After she was escorted out, and the council had unanimously found Kalin culpable, Ranson stood lifting his hand for silence before addressing the people. The mother confessor has been found guilty of all charges. Everyone hooted and hollered their satisfaction. They shouted for an immediate execution. The mother confessor will be executed, but not this day. He held his hand up angrily against the protests. They quieted. She has committed crimes against all the people. They must be given a chance to hear of justice being done. They must be given a chance to come to the beheading. It will be held in a few days when everyone harmed by this criminal has had a chance to come to see her executed. Neville Ranson stepped down and came around the dais. He stood in front of her, looking into her eyes. He spoke quietly to her and not to the crowd. You would think to use your power on me, Mother Confessor? That had been exactly what she had been thinking to use her power, knowing she would die in the process. But she said nothing. Ranson's smile was cold and cruel. 
You shall not have the chance. I'm going to strip you of three things. First, your power and its symbol. Second, your dignity. Third, your life. Kaylin threw herself at him. He stood, his hands clasped, and watched as she was able to move only inches before she was mired in a thickness of air that held her tight. She fought unsuccessfully against the staggering power that held her. The wizard lifted his hands. Kaylin saw a flash. She cried out as she felt a cold shock flood through her body. It felt as if she had plunged naked into an icy river. She shivered violently. The sting of cold brought tears to her eyes. The cold pain felt as if it could grow no worse, could hurt no more, but then it did. It felt as if her insides ripped, as if her heart were being torn from her chest. She screamed in pain. Stunned by the shock of it, she realized she was on her knees. Ranson was holding his hands out over her head. When the pain lifted, she felt tingling panic. Her power was gone. Where she had always felt it before, without even being aware of it most of the time, she now felt a forlorn emptiness. She had so often wished to be rid of it, but never realized what it would feel like to be without her magic. She cried out again. Tears streamed down her cheeks at the forsaken, vacant desolation. She felt naked before the mob of people. She forced herself to stop the tears. She would not let these people see the mother confessor cry. No, she would not let these people see Kaelin Amnell cry. Ranson drew Prince Fyron's sword from its scabbard. He stepped behind her. He took up her hair in his fist and pulled it out tight as she knelt on the cold floor. With the sword, he sliced her hair off, close, right at the nape of her neck. The shearing felt almost as shocking to her as having her power taken. The hair Richard loved so. She bit back tears. Neville Ranson held up the severed handful of her hair to wild cheering. Kaylin knelt, numbly staring at nothing as soldiers tied her wrists behind her back. Ranson grasped her arm under her shoulder and hauled her to her feet. The first of it then, Mother Confessor. You have been stripped of your power and its symbol, as I promised you. Now to the rest of it. Kaylin was silent. There was nothing to say as Ranson and a cluster of grinning guards led her down through the palace. She didn't pay any attention to where she was being taken. She was thinking about Richard, hoping he would remember her love for him. She lost herself in memories of him. She let the world around her go. She would soon let the world of life go, too. The good spirits had deserted her. She was numb to what was happening. The emptiness of being without her power left her feeling half dead already. She had never known how much it meant to her, how much a part of her the magic was until it was gone. She wondered if this dull bleakness was the way people without the power felt all the time. She couldn't imagine living without the magic. She longed for death now to end this dead feeling. Only Richard had accepted her with her power. She never completely accepted it herself, but Richard had. Now it was too late. She grieved more for the loss of her magic than her life. She knew now what the other creatures of magic would feel when it happened to them. She grieved for them. Ransom's hand on her arm jerked her to a halt, jerked her to awareness, before an iron door in a dim corridor. One of the guards worked at a rusty lock on the iron door. Kaylin recognized the door. She had taken confessions down here. And now to my second promise, Mother Confessor, Ransom said with a sneer. You will be stripped of your dignity. Kaelin gasped as his fist grabbed what was left of her hair and jerked her head back. As she was held helpless, her wrists bound painfully behind her back and her hair in his fist, Ranson kissed her neck. Right where Dark and Rao had kissed her neck. The same horrors coursed through her mind as when Dark and Rao had done it. She shuddered with revulsion, with the horror of the visions. In her mind, she saw the young women in Ebenissia. Only this time she was one of them. I would rape you myself, Ranson whispered in her ear. But I find your sense of honor disgusting. The door squeaked open, and without any further word, Ranson shoved her through the doorway into the pit. Chapter 59 Kaelin gasped at the feeling of falling through space. But before she had a chance to fully consider what would happen when she hit the floor... Rough hands caught her. 
they pushed her down to the cold stone. She saw the light of the doorway above disappear when the door clanged closed. In the light of a sputtering torch in a bracket, she saw grinning men all about, pushing in at her. The rope cut into her wrists. Her feelings of terror and helplessness gave way to desperate action. Kaelin kicked a man in the groin. She was on her back on the floor, so she had leverage to do damage. She rammed her heel into the face of another man leaning over her. He fell back with a cry. She kicked frantically at the others. The grasping hands caught her ankles. She kicked her legs, but the men held tight. She rolled to the side, breaking the grip, and skittered into a corner. Her freedom was only momentary. They seized her flailing legs again. In the back of her mind, as she fought, Kaylin desperately tried to think. A spark of thought tried to get her attention. It was something about Zed, but she couldn't think clearly. The men fighting to get at her pushed her white dress up her legs. Hands pawed at her thighs. Big, meaty fingers hooked her small clothes, stripping them down her legs and off her feet. She felt rough hands and cold air on her flesh. She fought the men, and at the same time, her own panic. Two men were on the floor, one holding his crotch, the other sprawled out, blood gushing from his ruined face. His nose was crushed. There were ten others, all trying to get at her at once. They threw each other back, trying to force themselves on top of her, the biggest working his way in. Kalen couldn't get her breath. With frantic effort, the spark of thought sprang forth. She remembered asking Zed if he could remove her power. She had wanted to be free of it so she could be with Richard. Zed had told her that it wasn't possible to rid a confessor of her power, that she was born with the magic, and it couldn't be separated from her as long as she was alive. How could Ranson have stripped her of her power? Zed was a wizard of the First Order. There was no wizard with more power than a wizard of the First Order. Why wouldn't Ranson have wanted to rape her first? He said she disgusted him. But he said he wanted to strip her of her dignity. Why wouldn't he want to do it? Unless he was afraid. Afraid she would figure it out. Figure what out? It came to her, the wizard's first rule. People would believe anything if they wanted to believe, or if they were afraid it was true. She was afraid it was true that he had stripped her of her power. Maybe he had used magic to give her pain and mask her ability to sense her own magic, to try to trick her into believing what she feared. As the men groped at her, she groped for her power. She tried to find calmness, the place of her magic, but it just wasn't there. All she felt was emptiness. Where she always felt the swell of magic before, she now felt only a numb, hollow void. She wanted to cry at the feel of the men's hands on her legs and between them, but she couldn't allow herself to lose control, her only chance. Try as she might, she couldn't find the magic, couldn't call it forth. It was simply gone. She desperately wanted her hands free. Wait, she screamed. The men all stopped for a moment, their faces pulling back, looking at her. She gasped to catch her breath. Talk, she ordered of herself, while you have the chance. You're doing it all wrong, they laughed. We think we'll figure it out, one said. Kaylin struggled to control her fear and think. They were going to do what they were going to do, and she couldn't stop them. Fighting them in this way was going to accomplish nothing except to feed her panic. She had only one chance, and that was to use her head. She had to slow them down and give herself time to think. If you do it this way, you will just be denying yourselves the full satisfaction of it. They frowned. What do you mean? If you're all fighting each other and me, you won't be able to really enjoy me as a woman. Wouldn't it be more enjoyable if I cooperated? They all looked at one another. One to the side spoke up. She has a point. The queen wasn't nearly so much good after she went numb on us. Queen, Kaelin asked. What queen? You men are just bragging on me. You've had no queen. Queen Cirilla, a different man said. She fainted on us, then went feeble-minded. Just lay there the whole time like a dead fish. But we had her anyway, had a queen. Still... Kaelin fought back the scream, fought to keep the meaning of what she had just learned from making her start kicking again. That would only get her the same as Cirilla. Her only chance was to use her head. She needed time to search for her magic, and if she somehow did find it, she needed the men separated. Otherwise, nine men would overpower that one. She had to have things organized first, in case the magic worked. And she needed the strongest to be the one. For an instant, she abandoned her idea, fearing it wouldn't save her, and worse, fearing she wouldn't have the nerve to do it. 
But then she bleakly realized that even if it didn't work, it didn't matter. They were going to rape her one way or the other. Her only chance was to try. She had nothing to lose. That's what I mean. Wouldn't you rather have my cooperation? I'm going to be down here for days. You'll each have more than your share of time on me. Wouldn't you rather I helped? That way you could all have what you want. She thought she might vomit. Keep talking, the biggest man said in a gruff voice. Kaylin stiffened her resolve. I've never had a man before. They all hooted at their luck. She waited until their leers came back to her. She fought back the urge to shriek at the looks in those eyes. Like I said, I've never had a man. I know you men are going to have me, and I can't stop you. If it's going to be done anyway, I'd rather enjoy it. Their hungry smiles widened. Yeah? Well, what do you think you'd enjoy most, little lady? If you did it one at a time, wouldn't that be better for you, too? If you weren't fighting each other, if you waited your turn, then you could concentrate on enjoying everything a real woman has to offer. A couple of the men grabbed at her legs, pulling them apart. They growled that they would have what they wanted their own way. The biggest, the one with the gruff voice, hauled them back, throwing one against the wall. His head banged with a loud thunk. Let her talk. She makes sense. He turned his vicious eyes on her. Let's hear your offer. Kaylin tried to slow her voice down and sound like she might be intrigued by the idea. She tried to sound self-confident as she shrugged. If you do it my way, I'll give you whatever you want. I'll make sure you enjoy whatever you like. Some of the men chuckled. The big man's eyes showed his suspicion. Why? And how do we know you mean it? Because I'll be able to enjoy it too that way. Kaylin swallowed back her fear. Untie my hands and I'll show you I mean it. She leaned forward as he untied her hands, another man taking the opportunity to fondle her breasts. She remained still. At last, her hands were untied. She rubbed her aching wrists and then smiled at the big man as she ran her fingers down his cheek. He slapped her hand away. You're running out of time. You better show us you mean what you say. Kaylin steeled herself as she leaned back against the wall. She pulled her dress up above her waist, drew her knees up, and spread her legs. She looked to the big man. Touch me. Three of the other men reached for her. She slapped their hands away. I said one at a time. She looked the big man in the eyes when they came up. He towered over the other men. What's your name? Tyler. One at a time. You first, Tyler. Touch me. The stone walls echoed with the sound of heavy breathing. The big man reached out and stroked her. It took all her strength to keep her knees apart. She forced herself to breathe. She prayed he couldn't see her shaking. A grin spread on his hulking face as his husky hand groped her. She coyly pushed his hand away and put her knees together. See? Isn't that better than some delicate woman who faints at the first touch and lies on the floor like a dead fish? The other men agreed that it surely was. Tyler gave her a suspicious look. You look like one of them confessors. Kalen sputtered a laugh. Confessor? She pulled out a short strand of hair. The feel of how short it was almost made her cry out in anguish. Does this look like I'm a confessor? No. But that dress... Well, Kalen said, she wasn't wearing it, so I borrowed it. Last I heard, they don't behead people for stealing a dress. What did you do to get yourself thrown in with us? She held her chin up. I didn't do anything. I'm innocent. The men laughed. They said that they too were innocent. Tyler wasn't laughing with them. He had a dangerous look in his eyes. She knew she had to do something and quick. With her heart thumping so hard, she thought it might come right out of her chest. She took Tyler's hand in both of hers and put it back up between her legs, pressing her thighs to it. Tyler's leering grin swept the caution from his face. So, what is it you want us to do? he asked. I'll make myself available here, and the rest of you all go over there while I'm with each man in turn. That way I'll feel safe enough to enjoy it, and at ease enough to make sure you do too. She looked back to the big man and licked her lips as she smiled. And I have one other condition. I want you first. I've always wanted a really big man. She shivered at the look in his eyes. She told herself that she was the mother confessor. She had to keep her head. 
She licked her lips again as she wiggled herself against his hand. Tyler burst into laughter. The others all chuckled nervously with him. You lofty ladies all act better than everyone else, but when it comes to it, you're just a whore, like all the rest. Age 595. His smile vanished in a way that made her heart skip a beat. I wrung the neck of the last whore what acted like she was better than me and decided to change her mind. That wizard told us what he'd do if we were to kill you, but that don't mean we won't make you regret it if you go back on your word. Kalen could only manage a smile and a nod. Let's get to it. A sweep of his arm scattered the others to the opposite side of the pit while she was desperately seeking the feel of her magic. He told them they could decide among themselves who went next. And then he turned to her. He started unbuckling his pants. Kaylin wildly searched her mind for a stall. She needed time to figure out how to find her power. How about a kiss first? I don't need no kiss, he growled. Open your legs like before. I liked that. Well, it's just that a kiss from a big, handsome man gets a woman randy to please him. He paused a moment then put his right arm around her shoulders and slammed her to the floor beside him. You better get Randy real quick before I lose my patience. I promise. Just kiss me a bit first. Tyler pressed his lips to hers. She gasped when his other hand suddenly went up between her legs, but this time with forceful insistence instead of a gentle touch like before. He thought the gasp was cooperation and pressed his lips harder to hers. She wrapped her arms around his neck. The smell of him almost made her sick. Kaylin tried to concentrate on finding the calm, as she always had before when she used her power. She could not find the place. She desperately sought the swell of magic but found nothing. Failure brought tears of frustration. Tyler's breathing was becoming emphatic. He was pressing so hard that it was hurting her lips against her teeth. She pretended to savor it. It was almost impossible to concentrate with the terror of what his hand was doing between her legs, but she dared not stop him. Panic rose in her throat as she forced herself to hold her legs open for him. Her heels pressed harder to the floor and her feet trembled in her boots. Kaylin reprimanded herself. She was the mother confessor. She had used her power countless times. She tried again, but nothing happened. Her memory of the young women in Ebenissia was keeping her from being able to focus. And then she thought of Richard. She almost wailed with longing for him. If she was ever to have a chance of seeing Richard again, she had to use her magic. She had to be strong. She had to do it for him. Nothing happened. She realized she was whimpering in frustration against Tyler's mouth. He took it for passion. His face pulled back a few inches. Spread your legs more so they can all see how much a fancy lady wants Tyler. She submissively drew her heels closer to herself and spread her knees wider. The men all hooted their approval. She could feel her ears burning. She remembered what Ranson had said about taking her dignity. Tyler pressed his lips back to hers. Tears seeped from the corners of her eyes. It wasn't working. She couldn't find her power, if it was even there. She had no choice. She was going to have to follow through with what she had offered the men. Failure to do so now would only bring her a beating on top of it. There was no escape. She thought about the poor women in Ebenissia. That was what was going to happen to her. It was hopeless. In her mind, she gave up. She surrendered to what was going to happen. Something her father had told her sprang to the front of her mind. If you ever give up, Kalen, you are lost. Fight with every breath. With the last, if you must. But don't give up, not ever. Don't hand them victory. Fight with what you have to the last breath. She wasn't doing that. She was giving up. Tyler sat up. Enough kissing. You're ready. She had run out of time. She wondered if Richard would hate her for this. No. He would know she had no choice. He would be disappointed only if she felt shame for being a victim. He had suffered unimaginable pain before Denna had done what she wanted. He knew what it meant to be helpless. She did not blame him for what was forced on him. He would not blame her. He would comfort her. If it didn't work with this man, she told herself, then maybe it would work with the next. She would keep trying with each. She would not give up. She would keep trying to find her power with each. Keep your legs open, Tyler growled as he undid his trousers. 
She realized she had unconsciously put her knees together. She obediently spread them again as a tear rolled down the side of her face. Dear spirits, she prayed, help me. No, the good spirits had never helped her before. They had never come to her aid before, despite her efforts on their behalf, despite her pleas. They would not come now to the keeper with the worthless good spirits. Don't cry, girl, she told herself. Fight them with your last breath if need be. Please, she said, just one more kiss. You had enough kissing. Time to do as you said. Time for me now. Kaylin pulled her heels up against herself, spread her legs as wide as she could and wiggled her bottom as he leered. Please, your kisses are the best I've ever had. Just one more, please. She watched his chest heave. Then I'll please you like no woman ever has. Just one more kiss. He flopped down on her, between her legs. His weight drove the wind from her lungs. One more, and then you deliver. He crushed his whiskered face to hers. He was out of control. His lips were cutting hers against her teeth. She tried to ignore the burning heat of him pressing painfully against her. Kalen slapped her hands to the sides of his muscular neck. Her lungs burned for air. This was her last chance, her last breath. Fight with it, she told herself. Fight for Richard. As she had done countless times, she released her restraint, although she felt no power pushing against it. It was like leaping into a dark, bottomless pit. There was thunder, but no sound. The violent jolt to the air brought down a shower of stone dust. The men all cried out with the pain of being so close when her power was released. Kaylin almost screamed with joy. She could feel the magic in her middle again. It was weak from having just been used, but she could feel it again. It was back. It had never left. Ranson had used magic to make her believe a lie. Tyler's jaw had gone slack as he pulled back, looking down into her eyes. Mistress, he whispered, command me. The other men were scrambling toward them. Protect me! Heads cracked against the walls, sending splashes of blood across the stone. Tyler snapped a man's arm. Wails of pain echoed around the room. There was a furious battle for a few minutes until Kalen was able to direct Tyler in accomplishing what she wanted, a truce. She didn't want him to fight all the men. If they succeeded in getting the better of him, then she was finished. She wanted them separated, the men keeping their distance and Tyler guarding her. That was her best chance of surviving until she could recover her power. She screamed orders to the men as well as Tyler. Six were left standing in fighting form and enraged. One was writhing on the ground, screaming in pain, a shattered bone jutting from his forearm. And the other four, including the one she had kicked in the face, were not moving. Kalen told the men that she would keep Tyler at bay as long as they stayed in their corner. Reluctantly, they moved to the opposite side, dragging the others with them. The screams kept them convinced that they should bide their time before taking on the big man with the wild eyes. She made them throw her her small clothes, under threat of sending Tyler to get them. Kaylin sat in the corner, her back against the wall. Tyler stood before her in a half-crouch, dancing on the balls of his feet, his arms out and ready. The men watched as they rested against the other wall. Kaylin knew that this uneasy truce could not go on for days. Sooner or later, Tyler would run out of energy. Then they would have him. Then they would have her. The men knew that, too. Chapter 60 The night wore on, with the men watching and Tyler guarding her. She caught a few moments of uneasy sleep from time to time. Kaylin had no idea what time it was, but she judged it to be between the middle of the night and close to dawn. Though she was afraid, and knew that they were going to come to behead her sooner or later, she felt joy that her power was back, and that she had beaten them with that much of it. The good spirits hadn't helped her, she had helped herself. She felt self-satisfaction at what she had done. She had not given up. And the good spirits had left her to it, as they always did. Kaylin was furious with the good spirits. Though she had lived her whole life to see their ideals upheld, they never once helped her. Well, no more. She was finished with the good spirits, as she was finished with trying to help the ungrateful people of the Midlands. What had it gotten her? She had learned in the council chambers what it had gotten her. It had gotten her the undying hatred of her people. The very people she fought for thought she harmed children. People didn't like confessors and were afraid of them for a variety of reasons. 
but she had been stunned to learn what people really believed about her. From now on, she was going to worry about herself, her friends, and Richard, and to the keeper with the rest of them. He could have them all. She was through with it all. She was the mother confessor no longer. She was Kalen. The torch sputtered out, plunging the pit into blackness. Thank you again, good spirits, she screamed at the top of her lungs. Her words echoed around the pit. To the keeper with you! The men set upon Tyler in the dark. Kalen didn't know what was happening. She could hear grunts and screams and thuds. She heard an echoing banging sound. She couldn't understand what it was. And then she heard a muffled voice calling out her title. The familiar voice was coming from above. Chandelin! Chandelin, I'm down here! Open the door! Mother confessor, came the voice from beyond the door. How do I open the door? Kalen let out a shriek when a hand snatched her ankle and pulled her from her feet. Chandelin called out at the sound of her scream. Tyler grabbed the fingers around her ankle and bent them back until they snapped. The man screamed in the dark. Chandelin, you need a key. Use the key. Key? What is this key? Chandelin, she shoved a head away from her middle. Chandelin, remember when we were in the city with the dead people? Remember the queen's room that was locked? Remember, I showed you a key to open the door? Chandelin, one of the guards up there has a ring on his belt. It has the key. Hurry! Kalen recognized Tyler's grunt as he was slammed to the wall. She could hear the bone-jarring blows of his fist. She could hear a metallic noise from above. Mother confessor, it will not turn. Then it's the wrong one. Try another. Someone crashed into her, knocking her to the floor. She clawed at his eyes. He punched at her middle. A sudden shaft of light descended into the pit. Tyler saw the man on her and threw him off. A ladder dropped down. Tyler, keep them away from the ladder. Kaylin threw herself onto the ladder and scrambled up. The men piled on Tyler. She heard him groan and then his neck snap. Her foot slipped through a rung when a fist punched the back of her calf. Hands grabbed at her ankles. Kaylin kicked the face of the man right behind and then clambered up. He tumbled back, taking the others with him. They charged back up in a rush. Kaylin stretched for the hand extended down. Chandelin clamped onto her wrist and yanked her through the doorway. He stabbed the man right behind her. As the man toppled back, Chandelin slammed the door closed. Panting, she fell into his arms. Come, Mother Confessor, we must get out of this place. There were dead guards everywhere, all killed silently from behind by Chandelin's troga. He held her hand as they ran through the dank, dark halls and upstairs. She wondered how Chandelin had managed to find his way down here. Someone must have shown him the way. Around a corner, they came to the site of a bloody battle. Bodies were sprawled everywhere. Only one man was standing. Orsk, his great battle axe dripped with gore. Orsk nearly leapt out of his skin with joy when he saw her. She was almost thrilled to see his scarred face. I made him wait, Chandelin explained, as he pulled her through the bloody mess. I told him that I would bring you if he waited and guarded this hall. Chandelin frowned at her. Kalin realized he was staring at her hair, or what was left of it. He said nothing, though, and she was glad for that. It felt more than strange not to feel the weight of her hair. It was heartbreaking. She had loved her hair. So had Richard. Kalin bent and took a war axe from one of the dead guards. With her power not yet recovered, she felt better with a weapon in her hands. Chandelin, dragging Kalin along by her hand with Orsk protecting the rear, burst through a door. Directly outside, the captain of the guards had a woman pressed up against the wall. Her arms were wrapped around his neck as she kissed him. His hands were up her dress. As they charged past and the startled captain looked up, Chandelin drove his long knife into the man's ribs. Come, he said to the woman. We have her. The woman fell in line with the rest of them as they wound their way up through the palace. Puzzled, Kalin looked back. The woman in the hooded cloak was the woman who had fainted, Jebra Bevinvir. What's going on? Kalin asked Jebra. Forgive me, Mother Confessor, for fainting. I had a vision of you being beheaded. It was so horrifying that I fainted. I knew I must help so that the vision would not come true. You told me that you had a friend in the woods. I went and found him. They all flattened up against a wall and waited for a patrol to pass through an adjoining room. When their echoing footsteps faded, Chandelin turned with a hot look to Jebra. What were you doing with that man? She blinked in surprise. He was the captain of the guards. He was making the rounds with a whole detachment. 
I convinced him to send the guards away for a while. I did the only thing I could think of to keep 50 men from trapping you down there. Chondolin grumbled that maybe it made sense. As they headed on, Kaelin told Jebra that she had done a brave thing and that she understood what courage it took to do it. Jebra protested that she was no heroine and didn't want to be one. At an intersection with a vaulted corridor, Mistress Sanderholt was waiting. Letting out a cry, Kaelin threw her arms around the woman. Mistress Sanderholt held her bandaged hands out. Not now, Mother Confessor. You must escape. This way is clear. As the others rushed in the direction Mistress Sanderholt indicated, Kaelin went the other way. They all turned and ran after. What are you doing? Chondolin yelled. We must escape. I have to get something from my room. What could be more important than escaping? Grandfather's knife, she said as she ran. When they realized they were not going to be able to change her mind, they all followed after as she led them up through the labyrinth of smaller and less frequently patrolled halls. Several times they did encounter guards. Orsk fiercely hacked them to pieces when they charged after her. As she came around a corner at the top of a stairway, a surprised guard spun to her. With all her strength, Kalin buried her axe in the center of his chest. His sword skittered across the floor as he went down on his back. As he thrashed on the floor, Kalin put a foot against his heaving stomach and tried to pull the axe out. Bubbles of air and blood frothed forth, but the axe was stuck tight in his breastbone, so she scooped up his Keltish sword instead. Chandelin lifted an eyebrow. Before they reached her room, she had caused to use the sword, and with similar deadly effect. The others waited in the outer room, recovering their wind while she rushed into her bedroom. She froze when she saw her blue wedding dress. She swept it up and held it to her breast. That was what she had come for. She didn't want to leave it. She was never returning to this place. Kaylin shed a tear on the dress, rolled it into a tight bundle, and stuffed it in her pack. All the other clothes from her pack were cleaned, too, and laid out for her. She stuffed them in the pack after strapping the bone knife around her left arm. She threw the mantle around her shoulders. Hurriedly, she strung the bow. She swept through the outer room, her pack and quiver on her back, and her bow on her shoulder. She had everything she wanted. Everything that meant anything to her. She paused a moment, looking at her room for the last time, as she idly turned the round bone on her necklace, and then led the others out and down a back way, headed for an outside door. She lost count of how many men Chandelin took out with his troga, or knife. When a big guard charged out of a side hall and tried to roll them down, Kalin ran him through with the sword. The four of them were grim death moving through the palace. The alarm bells rang frantically in the tower. On the landing leading to the great staircase, Orsk lopped off a guard's head. The body rolled down the stairs, spilling a trail of blood, as if unrolling a red carpet for them. The headless man flopped to a stop against the statue of Magda Cirrus, the first mother confessor. They ran down the stone steps, the sound echoing in the vast chamber. Near the bottom, a sudden stab of pain took Kaylin's feet out from under her. She tumbled down the last few steps. The others shouted and rushed to her, wanting to know how she was hurt. She told them that she had just stumbled. She hadn't stumbled. Kaylin pulled her bow off her shoulder and pointed with it. Down that hall, all of you. Head down that hall. Turn right at the end. I'll catch up with you. Go! We're not leaving you, Chandelin insisted. I said go! Kaylin moved against the blistering pain in her legs. Ors, get them moving now. I'll catch up. I will be displeased with you if you fail to get them out of here. Orsk raised his axe and growled. The other two backed toward the hall as they pleaded with her. They protested that they had risked their lives to rescue her, and they would not leave her now. Orsk, get them out of here. Why? Chandelin and Jebra yelled together. Kalin pointed with her bow. Across the great chamber, up in one of the distant arcades, stood a shadowed figure. Because otherwise he'll kill you. We must escape. He will kill you too. If he lives... He will hunt us down with magic and kill us all. A bolt of yellow lightning arced across the broad room. Stone crashed down, nearly covering the opening where the other stood. Kaylin drew one of Chandelin's flat-bladed man-killer arrows from her quiver. Mother confessor, Chandelin screamed. You cannot make that shot. I could not make that shot. You must run. She didn't tell them that the wizard was sending slashing shards of pain through her, and she couldn't run. It was all she could do just to stand. Orsk, get them out, now! I'll catch up! Another bolt of lightning sent stone flying everywhere, and the three of them running down the hall, Orsk pushing them along. 
Kaylin put a knee to the floor to steady herself as she knocked the arrow. She drew the string to her cheek. The blade of the arrow was horizontal in her line of sight. She could hardly see Ranson. He was so far away, and the pain was blurring her vision. But she could hear him laugh as he sent violent splinters of magic ripping through her. It sounded like Darken Rawls' laugh. She bit the inside of her cheek against the pain, against the scream trying to fight its way out. She couldn't hold back the clipped whimpers. An archer, Mother Confessor, he called from the distance. His laughter echoed off the stone around her. Your freedom was brief, Mother Confessor. I hope it was worth it to you. You will spend a good long time in the pit thinking about it. He was too far away. She had never made a shot from this far. Richard had. She had seen him do it. Please, Richard, help me. Show me how like you did that day. Help me. Stone vines tore from the panel next to her and whipped around her middle, squeezing. The shearing pain made her shriek. She brought up the bow again. With her last breath, if need be, she told herself. Her arms shook. She could hardly see the wizard. He was too far away. The vines held her tight. She couldn't run even if she wanted to. Help me, Richard. Another brutal wave of pain seared up her legs and threw her insides. Burning tears ran down her cheeks as she shuddered and gasped. She couldn't hold the bow up. Lightning arced around the great staircase. The sound was deafening. Stone chips whistled past. Clouds of dust rose as a column collapsed with a crash. She heard Richard's words in her mind. You have to be able to shoot no matter what is happening. Just you and the target. That's all there is. Nothing else matters. You have to be able to block everything else out. You can't think about how afraid you are or what will happen if you miss you have to be able to make the shot under pressure. She remembered how he had whispered to her, whispered for her to call the target. With a jolt, the target came to her, as if the wizard were standing right in front of her. She could see the flashes of liquid light jumping from his fingertips. She could see her target, the bump in his throat, bobbing up and down as he laughed. She let her breath flow out as Richard had taught her. The arrow found the notch in the air, as gentle as a baby's breath, the arrow left the bow. She saw the feathers clear the bow. She saw the string hit her wrist. The stone vine wrapped around her throat. She kept her eyes on the target. She watched the feathers of the arrow as it flew. The pain tearing her insides rose with his laughter. The wizard's laughter cut off abruptly. Kalin heard the thunk of the blade hitting his throat. When the stone vine suddenly dropped away, she fell forward on her hands and knees tears dripping from her face as she waited for the pain to melt away. It went with merciful swiftness. Kaylin staggered to her feet. To the keeper with you too, Wizard Neville Ranson. There was an ear-splitting crack, like a lightning strike, but instead of a flash of light, a ripple of total darkness swept across the room. Bumps rippled up her arms. The lamps flickered back on. Kaylin knew the keeper had indeed taken Wizard Neville Ranson. She heard a grunt and turned just in time to see a guard leaping down the steps toward her. Kalin ducked and came up under him as he landed. She used his momentum to loft him over the railing into the well below. He snatched at her as he went over, but his fingers caught only her necklace. It tore from her and went down with him. Kalin bent over the railing, seeing him smack the stone floor three flights down. She saw the necklace tumble from his hand when he hit and slide across the floor. Curse the good spirits, she growled. Kaylin started for the stairs to retrieve her bone necklace, but skidded to a stop and looked up at the sound of boots on stone. More guards were coming. She hesitated for a moment, looking down, and then ran for the hallway instead. The spirits hadn't helped her. What good was a necklace going to do? It wasn't worth her life. Kaylin caught the others as they made the outside doors. They all sighed with relief to see her and to hear that the wizard wouldn't be coming after them. Kaylin led as they ran out into the night. The four of them raced down the expansive steps to the relentless sound of the alarm bells behind. She headed south, the shortest distance to the woods. A breathless Jebra caught her arm, dragging her to a stop. Mother Confessor. I am not the Mother Confessor any longer. I am Kalin. Kalin, then. But you must listen to me. You cannot run away. Kalin turned back to the path through the courtyard. I'm through with this place. Zed needs you. Kalin spun back. Zed? You know Zed? Where is he? Jebra gulped air. 
Zed sent me to Aidendril the day after you left Ahara. He said he had to go get a woman named Addie, and then he would come to the wizard's keep. He sent me here to help you and Richard and have you wait. Zed needs you. Kalin gripped Jebra's shoulders. I need Zed. I need him very badly. Then you must let me help you. You must not leave. They will expect you to run and will search the countryside. They will not expect you to remain in Aidendril. Remain? Stay in Aidendril? She thought a moment. She was known in Aidendril. No, not exactly. Her long hair was known. People other than counselors, ambassadors, staff, and nobility rarely saw the Mother Confessor up close. And when they did, they mostly stared at her long hair. She no longer had that hair. The thought of her loss made her insides knot up. She hadn't known how much her power and her long hair meant to her until they were gone. It might work, Jebra, but where would we hide? Zed gave me gold. No one knows of my involvement in your escape. I will rent rooms and hide you, all of you. Kalin considered it a moment, then smiled. We could be your servants. A lady like you would have servants. Jebra shrank back. Mother Confessor, I could not do that. I am nothing but a servant myself. Zed made me pretend to be a lady, but I could not pretend that. You are a true lady. Being a servant does not make you less than me. We all can be only who we are, no more, no less. Kalin started them all off again, toward a part of Aiden Drill with quiet, secluded, and exclusive ends. And it is startling to learn what you can do when you have to. We will do what we must. But if you keep calling me Mother Confessor, you are going to get us all killed. I will do my best. Kalin, all I know is that we must wait until Zed returns to Aiden Drill. She tugged insistently on Kalin's sleeve. Mother Confessor, where is Richard? It is vital. Her voice lowered with unease. No slight intended, and I pray none is taken. But it is Richard that is important. Zed needs Richard. That is why I need Zed, Kalin said. Chapter 61 Richard grabbed an arm of each boy. Slow down, he said in a low voice. I told you, I have to go first. Kip and Hirsch sighed impatiently. Richard checked around the corner, peeking down the hall, and then pushed the two boys up against the wall. Frogs kicked in their pockets. This is serious. I picked you two because I know you're the best. Now you do as I told you, the way we planned it. Stay here with your backs to this wall and count to fifty. You don't so much as peep around the corner until you get to fifty. I'm depending on you to do it right. They grinned. We're your men, Kip said. We'll get them out of there. Richard squatted and put a finger close to each face in turn. This is serious business. This isn't just some game. This time you could get in real trouble. Are you sure you want to do this? Kip put his hands in his pockets, feeling the frogs. You came to the right men. We can do it. We want to do it, Richard. They were excited because they had never made it past the guards before. This was uncharted territory for their specialty. Richard knew they didn't appreciate the danger involved, and he hated to have to use them in this manner, but it was the only thing he could think of. All right, then. Start counting. Richard rounded the corner and swept down the hall, his Mriswith cape billowing open. When he reached the proper door, he stood against the white marble wall opposite the double doors and drew the hood up. He pulled the cape closed and concentrated on the marble behind him. He stood motionless. The boys burst around the corner, yelling and screaming at the top of their lungs as they ran down the hall. They stopped in front of the double doors, looking both ways. They didn't see him standing behind them, and he knew they were wondering where he was hiding. As they had been instructed, they threw the doors open and giggling with excitement began pulling frogs from their pockets and pitching them into the room. The two sisters were frozen in surprise for only an instant. Richard watched as both came flying around their desks, one snatching up a rod. The boys heaved their last frogs with a squeal and raced away in opposite directions, shouting taunts of, Can't catch us! Can't catch us! Sisters Ulyssia and Fenella slid to a stop on the polished marble floor outside the doors. They almost slid right into him and were only inches away. Richard held his breath. The sisters saw the boys make the turns at opposite ends of the hall. They threw their hands out. Pictures crashed to the floor as flashes of shimmering light knocked them from the walls at the end, but they missed the boys. Growling in anger, the sisters parted, one dashing after each boy. Richard waited until they had turned the corner, and then he stepped away from the wall, letting his concentration relax, letting the cape return to black. He wondered what it would look like if someone were to see it happen, to see a person seem to materialize out of the air. The outer room was empty. 
Before the door between the desks, the air seemed to sparkle and hum. Experimentally, Richard put his hand into it. The air felt thick, but it seemed to have no harmful effect. He pressed himself through the sparkles and went through the door beyond. The room inside, not quite as large as his own outer room, was dimly lit and paneled in rich dark wood. In the center sat a heavy walnut table piled with papers and books and three candles. Down the length to each side were floor-to-ceiling bookshelves crammed full of disheveled books and a few other odd objects. An old woman, one of the cleaning staff, in a heavy dark gray work dress was standing on a stool, dusting a top bookshelf. She turned with surprise as he came to a halt. She glanced to the door and then back to him. How did you... I'm sorry, ma'am, I didn't mean to startle you. I just came to see the prelate. Is she about? The woman squatted, her foot searching for the floor. Richard gave her his hand. She smiled her appreciation as she brushed a wisp of graying hair back from her face. Most of it was drawn into a loose knot at the back of her head. Once she was standing on the floor, the top of her head only came up to the lower tip of his breastbone. Her body was on the wide side, as if she had once been taller, and a giant had put his hand on the top of her head and squashed her down a good foot. She looked up, giving him a curious frown. Did sisters Ulyssia and Fenella let you come in? No, Richard said as he looked about the comfortably cluttered room. They stepped out. But they would have left a shield. Ma'am, I must speak to the prelate. Across the room, Richard saw doors to a courtyard standing open. Is she about? Do you have an appointment? She asked in a quiet, gentle voice. No, he admitted. I've been trying to get one for days. Those two wouldn't cooperate, so I made my own appointment. She put a finger to her lower lip. I see. But you must have an appointment. Those are the rules. I'm sorry. Richard started for the open doors. He was getting impatient, but kept his voice calm, as he didn't want to frighten the old maidservant. Look, ma'am, I must see the prelate, or we are all going to have an appointment with the keeper himself. Her eyebrows lifted in wonder. Really? She clicked her tongue. The keeper, is it? My, my, my. Richard stopped suddenly. He winced and let out a groan. He turned on his heel. You're the prelate, aren't you? An impish grin came to her face, her eyes twinkling with it. Yes, Richard, I guess I am. You know who I am? She chuckled. Oh, yes, I know. Richard sighed. So you're the one who runs this place? She laughed louder. As I hear it told, you seem to be running it now. Been here hardly a month, and you have half the palace wound around your will. I've been thinking about asking for an appointment to see you. Richard gave her a friendly scowl. I would have granted it. I've been looking forward to meeting you. She patted his arm. From now on, you may come to see me whenever you wish. Then why wouldn't you let me in before? She folded her hands together beneath her ample rounded breasts. A test, my boy, a test. She smiled up at him. I am impressed. I expected it to take you another six or eight months yet. The door burst open. Richard was jerked from his feet, yanked back by his collar, and smacked up against the wall. He was stuck tight, the wind knocked from his lungs. Two irate sisters stood just inside the doorway with their fists on their hips. Now, now, the prelate said. Stop that, you two. Let the boy down. Richard thumped to the ground, glaring at the two sisters. I am the one who talked those two boys into doing as they did. What they did is my fault. If there is any revenge, it had better be against me and not them. If you harm them, you will answer to me. One of the sisters took a step toward him. Their punishment has already been ordered. This time, for once, they will learn a lesson. She angrily pointed a stout rod at him. You are going to have your own punishment to worry about. Yes, Sister Ulyssia, the prelate said. I think punishment is in order. The sister gave Richard a self-satisfied smile. Yours, the prelate said. Sister Ulyssia gaped. Prelate Annalena? Did I not give you specific instructions that Richard was not to be allowed in here? The two sisters straightened. Yes, prelate Annalena. And here he is, standing in my office. Sister Ulyssia pointed at the door. But we left a shield... He could not. Oh, could not? The sister's hand dropped at seeing the prelate's wrinkled brow. Seems I see him standing here, do I not, sisters? Yes, prelate Annalena, 
the two said as one. And so now your idea is to reward your own failure by going back to your posts as if nothing had happened and punish their success? The prelate clicked her tongue. You two will take the punishment you have ordered for the two boys. The sisters blanched. But, prelate, the second whispered, you can't have that done to a sister. Really, Sister Fenella, what did you order for the boys? To have their bottoms strapped publicly tomorrow morning after breakfast. That sounds fair. You two will take their place. But, prelate, Sister Ulyssia whispered in astonishment, we are sisters of the light. That would be humiliating. Learning humility never harmed anyone. We are all humble before the Creator. For your failure, you will be strapped in their place. Sister Ulyssia stiffened. And if we fail to submit Prelate Annalena? The Prelate smiled. Then you would be telling me that you no longer deserve to be trusted, and further, that you no longer wish to be sisters of the light. They both bowed. When the door closed behind them, Richard lifted an eyebrow to the prelate. I hope never to get on your wrong side, prelate Annalena. She chuckled. Please, call me Anne. That is what my old acquaintances call me. I'd be honored to call you Anne, prelate, but I'm not an old acquaintance. You think not? She smiled. My, what a knowledgeable boy. Well, no matter. Call me Anne anyway. Do you know why I punished them? Because you took responsibility for your actions. They did not recognize the importance of that. You are learning to be a wizard. What do you mean? You knew it was dangerous to cross those two, did you not? Richard nodded. Yet you used those boys, knowing that it was a possibility they could be hurt. Yes, but I had to do it. It's that important. And it was the only thing I could think of. The burden of a wizard. That's what it is called. Using people. A wise wizard understands that he cannot do everything himself and that if the matter is important enough, he must use other people to accomplish what must be done, even if it is to cost those other people their lives. It's a rare ability and vital to being a good wizard, perhaps to being a prelate, too. And it's urgent. I must speak with you. Urgent, is it? Well, then, why don't we go for a walk in my garden and we can talk about this urgent business? She placed her arm in his and walked him through the open doorway. Outside in the moonlight was a grand, expansive courtyard with trees, paths, flower beds, wild areas, and a lovely pond. The beauty of the garden didn't register in Richard's mind. He had hardly been able to eat or sleep since he had had his talk with Warren. If the keeper escaped, he would have everyone, including Kalen. Richard had to do something. And there is great trouble in the world. I need your help. I need this collar off so I may go help. That's what I am here for, Richard, to help. What is the trouble? The keeper, the nameless one, she corrected. What difference does it make? Calling him by his name calls his attention. And it's just a word. It's the meaning of the word that matters, not an arrangement of letters. Do you think that when you call the keeper the nameless one instead that he would be fooled into thinking you weren't speaking of him? It's a mistake to assume your enemies are ignorant and you are clever. A hearty laugh rose from in her chest. I have been waiting for a very long time for someone to figure that out. She paused with him at the edge of the pond, and he asked, What is the pebble in the pond? She gazed out over the water. You are one, Richard. You mean there are more than one? A small stone floated through the air up into her hand. Everyone has an effect on others. Some people inspire others to do great things. Some take people into crime with them. Those with the gift affect those around them even more. The stronger the Han, the stronger the effect. What does that have to do with me? What does that have to do with a pebble in a pond? You see all the duckweed floating on the surface. Say that's the other people, the world of life, and this pebble is you. She tossed the stone into the pond. See what happens? The ripples caused by you affect everyone else. Without you, all those ripples would not have happened. So they float up and down on the ripples. But the stone sank. She gave him a humorless grin. Don't ever forget that. The answer gave him pause. I think you invest too much faith in me. You don't know anything about me. Perhaps more than you think, child. And what is it that concerns you about the keeper? Something must be done. He's about to escape. One of the boxes of Orden has been opened. The gateway is open. The stone of tears is in this world. 
I need to do something. Ah. She smiled as she drifted to a stop. So you, who was just thrown up against a wall by the Han of a mere sister, wants to go off and battle the Keeper himself? But things have happened. Something must be done. I see you have been talking to Warren. A very bright young man, Warren. He is still young, though. Sometimes he needs direction. Guidance. She tipped a branch closer. He studies hard and loves those books. I think he must know every smudge on them. She was inspecting a flower on the branch. As he watched her in the moonlight, he decided he might have thought himself more clever than he was. Warren, too. So, what about the keeper? What about the Stone of Tears? She put her arm back through his and walked him on. If the gateway is open and the Stone of Tears is in this world, Richard, why does the Keeper not have us? Hmm? Maybe he's about to swallow us all at any moment. Ah, so you think that maybe he is busy with his dinner, and when he is finished and wipes his chin clean, he will get around to swallowing the world of the living? So you want to rush off and close the gateway before he picks his napkin from his lap? Is this the way you think the world's beyond ours work? In the same terms as this world? Richard nervously raked his fingers through his hair. I don't know. I don't know how it all works, but Warren said, Warren does not know everything. He is but a student. He has a talent for the prophecies, but he has much to learn. Do you know why we keep the prophecies down in the vaults and restrict who may read them? For the very reason we are having this discussion, because prophecy is dangerous to the untrained mind, and sometimes even to the trained mind. There is more to things than you see, or the keeper would have us already. Are you saying we're not in danger? She smiled a sly smile. We are always in danger, Richard. As long as there is a world of the living, there will be danger. All life is mortal. She patted his arm again. You are an important person, a person in prophecy. But if you go off foolishly, you can cause more harm than good. The stone of tears being in this world cannot in itself allow the keeper to escape through the gateway. The stone is a means to that end. I hope you're right, he said, as they walked on. She glanced up. How is your mother doing? Richard looked off into the darkness. She died when I was young, in a fire. I'm sorry, Richard. And your father? Which one, he muttered. Your stepfather, George. Richard cleared his throat. He was killed by Dark and Rahl. He darted her a sidelong glance. How do you know my stepfather? She gave him one of those timeless looks that he had seen from others before from Addie, Shota, Sister Verna, Du Shailu, and Kalin. I'm sorry, Richard, I didn't know he had died. George Cipher was quite a man. He came to a stop, his flesh a tingle. You, he whispered, you are how my father got that book. He left the statement vague enough that she would have to fill in the details to confirm it. A little of her smile came back. Afraid to say it out loud? The Book of Counted Shadows, that is the book you are speaking of. She gestured to a stone bench. Sit down, Richard, before you fall down. Richard slumped to the bench. He looked up as she stood before him. You? You gave that book to my father? Actually, I helped him get it. You see, Richard, as I told you, you and I are old acquaintances. Of course, the last time I saw you, you were bawling your head off. Only a few months old you were. She smiled distantly. If your mother could see you now, she was bursting with pride over you. She said you were the blessing to balance the curse. You see, Richard, balance is what the world of the living is all about. You are a child of balance. I have much invested in you. Richard's tongue seemed stuck to the top of his mouth. Why? Because you are a pebble in the pond. Her eyes seemed to go out of focus. Over 3,000 years ago, wizards had subtractive magic. None since has been born with it. We have been hoping, but none until now has come into this life. A few have had the calling, but not the gift of it. You have the gift for both additive and subtractive magic. Richard shot to his feet. What? Are you mad? Sit down, Richard. The quiet power of her voice, her penetrating gaze, her presence, made him sink to the bench. For some reason, she seemed suddenly very big to him. She was the same size as before, but it felt as if she towered over him. Her voice became imposing, too. Now you listen to me. You are causing me a great deal of trouble. You are like a bull that keeps knocking down fences and trampling the crops. Too much is at stake to have you acting without knowing what you are doing. I know you think you are doing right, but so does the bull. 
Your problem is lack of knowledge. I intend to give you an education. Though you will not believe some of what I have to tell you, you had better come to accept it, or you will be in that collar a good long time, because it cannot come off until you accept the truth. I was told the sisters took the collar off. The look in her eyes made him wish he had kept his mouth closed, or that he could trade places with the two sisters who were to take a public strapping. Only when you accept yourself, accept your ability, your true power, will it come off. You put the Radahan around your own neck. We don't have the power to take it off until you can help us with your own power. The only way you can do that is to learn and to accept who you are. Now, first of all, you must understand about the Keeper and the Creator and the nature of this world. Your problem, the problem most people have, the problem Warren has, is that you try to understand the worlds beyond in terms of this world. Good and evil, the Creator and the Keeper, are chaos divided into two opposing forces. Although each abhors the other, they are interdependent and cannot exist one without the other. They define each other. The struggle, our struggle in this world, is maintaining the balance. Although Richard kept his mouth shut, he couldn't keep the frown from his face. From the Creator springs life, the soul of life. It blooms into this world. Without the Keeper, without death, there can be no life. Without death, life would be open-ended. Can you even imagine a world in which no one ever died, where every child born lives forever, where every plant that sprouts flourishes, where every tree lives forever and every seedling sprouts and grows to a tree? What would happen? How could we eat? If we could kill no animal or harvest no crop, if it all lived forever and could not die, a never-ending life of gnawing, ravenous hunger, the world of the living would be consumed by chaos and destroy itself forever. Death, the underworld, as some call it, is eternal. You think of it in terms of this life. In eternity, time has no meaning, no dimension. To the keeper, a second or a year has no meaning. It is through those in this world who serve him that the keeper is given the dimension of time. It is their urgency that drives his struggle because they understand time. He needs the living if he is to succeed. His promises to those who help him are seductive, and they hunger for his triumph. So what part did the living play in this? We divide and define the chaos with order and keep it separated. Light and dark, love and hate, good and evil, we are the balance. We are like the duckweed floating on the surface of the pond. The air above is the creator, the depths below the keeper. The souls of the living, which have come down from the creator, blossom to life in this place, and when they die, they descend to the world of the dead. But that does not mean it is evil. Evil is a judgment we put on it. The keeper is like the muck at the bottom of the pond. Spirits of the dead reside anywhere from the depths of that chaos and hate near the keeper to near the living, near the light of the creator. It is the hope of the living to spend eternity in the warmth of that light. It is we, the living, who separate and define the worlds to each side of life. Magic is the element that gives this world the power to do that. Magic is the balance point. The keeper would like to swallow the world of the living to triumph. To do that, he must eliminate magic. But at the same time, in order to triumph, he must use magic to tip the balance. Richard struggled to keep his head above the murky waters of confusion. And wizards have the power to influence this balance? She was still leaning over him. She held up a finger. Yes, you have both sides of the magic. Her smile evaporated in a way that took his breath with it. That makes you an extremely dangerous person, Richard. You have both sides of the gift. You have the power to mend or destroy the veil. There are good people who, if they knew of your power, would kill you in a twinkling for fear you might destroy us all, if not deliberately, by accident. And you, are you one of those? If I were, I would not have helped your father get the Book of Counted Shadows. Your involvement stopped the immediate threat, but it also fed the gateway magic and chances greater danger in the future. It was a risk I had to take because the consequences of not doing so would have been disaster. But if what has happened is not fixed, it will be greater disaster in the end. What is the veil? Where is it? She reached out and tapped his forehead. The veil is within those of us with magic. We are its custodians. That is why balance means so much to those with the gift. When the veil is torn, the balance is tipped. The further it tips, the more the veil tears. 
The creator rules his domain, the keeper his. The keeper needs the creator to feed him life. The creator needs the keeper to allow it to be renewed. The veil keeps the balance. Her face was grim. This view would be considered blasphemy by many. They see the keeper only as evil that must be destroyed. But to do so would ultimately accomplish the opposite, all life being swept away like a sandbar in a river flood. Just for the sake of argument, what if I did have both kinds of magic? What is my power for? Most wizards have a talent that leans in a particular direction. Some are healers. Some make things of magic. More rare are prophets. The most rare are war wizards. There has not been one born in over 3,000 years until you. Richard wiped his sweaty palms on his pant legs. I don't like the sound of that. War wizard has two meanings which balance each other, as in all things magic. The first meaning is that they can tear the veil, bring destruction and death, war. And the second is that they have the magic needed to fight against the powers of the keeper. Being a war wizard does not mean you are evil, Richard. Many who fight do so to protect those who are defenseless. It means you have the capacity to care enough to fight, to defend the innocent. Lest he who's born true can fight for life's bond, and that one is marked, he's the pebble in the pond, Richard quoted. She lifted an eyebrow. For one who professes to scoff at prophecy, you seem to know some of the more pivotal passages. If I'm not entirely addled, I expect you have been marked. Richard could feel the scar on his chest as he nodded. Are you saying that my life is already marked out? That I'm just meant to live it out as it has been preordained? No, Richard. Life is not predetermined. The prophecies mean only that you have potential. You have the ability to influence events. That's why it is so important for you to learn. Of most importance is that you learn to accept yourself. If you do not do this, you will harm the most vital part of yourself, your free will. If you act without understanding, you could cast yourself into the chaos. I let you live when you were born because you have the potential for doing good. Within you is the hope of life. But until you truly accept both sides of your magic, you are a danger to every living thing. Richard desperately wanted to change the subject. He felt as if the world were crushing him. What is the stone of tears? She gave a little shrug. In the world of the dead, it exists as a force. In this world, it exists as an object with power, representing that force. The stone of tears is like a weight that holds the keeper at the infinite end of his world, where his influence here is diminished to the point of balance. Then, if it's here, off him, he is freed from his prison. If that were true, we would all be dead, hmm? She lifted a questioning eyebrow, but Richard didn't say anything. It's one of the seals that locks the keeper beyond. There are others that still hold. Magic helps hold him back for now. The Stone of Tears has the power, though, to destroy the balance, to tear the veil and free the keeper, if it is used in this world by such as you in the wrong way. You see, the stone has the power to vanish any soul to the infinite depths of the underworld. But if it were used in that way, through hate, through selfishness, it would feed power to that side and destroy the veil. The veil can only be restored by one with the gift for both sides of the magic. The stone must be put back where it belongs. We must struggle to keep the other seals intact until the day when one such as you can restore this lock while there is still time. Meanwhile, the keeper gains strength here. His minions struggle to break the other seals. There are other ways to free the keeper. Anne, are you sure about me? Maybe you proved it just tonight by walking through that shield. Our shields are made of additive magic. The only way for you to penetrate it was for your Han to use subtractive. Maybe my Han, my additive magic, is just stronger. When you came through the Valley of the Lost, you would have been drawn to the towers, to both towers. Am I right? I could have just come across them by accident. She let out a tired sigh. The towers were created by wizards who had both kinds of power. In the White Tower, there is white sand, sorcerer's sand. I doubt you would have taken any. That doesn't prove anything. And what is sorcerer's sand? Sorcerer's sand is extremely valuable, nearly priceless. It is only gathered by chance happenings across the tower. 
Sorcerer's sand is the crystallized bones of the wizards who gave their life into the towers. It's a sort of distilled magic. It gives power to spells drawn with it, good and evil. The proper spell drawn in white sorcerer's sand can invoke the keeper. You took instead some of the black sand, did you not? Well, yes. I just wanted a little bit, that's all. She nodded. Just a little bit. Richard, no wizard since the towers were built has been able to gather any black sorcerer's sand. It cannot be taken from a tower by any but those with subtractive magic. Guard that black sand with your life. It's more valuable than you can imagine. Why? What will it do? Black sorcerer's sand is the counter to the white. They nullify each other. The black, even one grain of it, will contaminate a spell drawn to invoke the keeper. It will destroy the spell. A spoonful of it is a weapon worth kingdoms. Still, he said, it could just be that the last wizards born with both kinds of magic invested the palace of the prophets with their magic. The prophets of that time knew one would be born again with both sides of the magic, a war wizard, and so they created two, the Hagen Woods and the Mriswith. One born with the subtractive would be drawn to that place, drawn to do battle there. The collar keeps the additive gift from killing you. The Hagen Woods provide an outlet for the other side of your power. It is something the sisters cannot provide. But I used the sword of truth. His voice sounded to him like a plea into a gale. It was the sword. The sword of truth was also created by wizards with the gift for both sides of the magic. Only one born the same could bring out the full range of its magic. Only you can use the sword to its full potential. And you have not done so yet. It is an aid to you, but even so, you do not need it to kill them with. Your gift is enough. If you do not believe me, leave your sword and go into the Hagen Woods with just your knife. You will still kill the Mriswith. Others have used this blade. They didn't even have the gift, much less subtractive magic. They were not truly using the sword's magic. The blade was made for you. It's an aid. Much as prophecy is an aid. Much as the Mriswith are an aid, sent down through time. I don't think I could be one of these war wizards. Do you eat meat? What does that have to do with anything? You are a child of balance. Wizards must balance themselves, the things they do, their power. War wizards rarely eat meat. Their abstinence is a balance for the killing they sometimes must do. I'm sorry, Anne, but I just can't believe I have subtractive magic. That's why you are such a danger. Every time you encounter magic, your Han learns more about how to protect you, to serve you, but you are not aware that it is learning. The Radahan helps it grow, though you're not aware of the process. You do things without knowing the importance or the reason, like when you were drawn to the black sorcerer's sand and took it, or when you took the round screen bone from Addie. Richard's brow pulled together. You know Addie, too? Yes. She helped your father and me get through the pass so we could retrieve the Book of Counted Shadows. What round bone are you talking about? Richard saw the slightest twitch of alarm in her eyes. Addie had a round bone carved all over with beasts. It's an object of great power. Your subtractive magic would have drawn you to it. Richard remembered seeing the round bone on a high shelf. I saw such a thing at her house, but I didn't take it. I wouldn't take something that didn't belong to me. Maybe that means I don't really have subtractive magic, she straightened. No, you noticed it. The fact that you didn't take it means only that since you did not have the Radahan on, yet your power had not developed enough to draw you to the screen bone, the way it drew you to the black sand. Richard hesitated. Is this some kind of problem? She smiled. It looked forced to him. No. Addie would protect that bone with her life. She knows how important it is. You can recover it in the future. What does it do? It helps protect the veil. When used by a war wizard like you with both powers, it invokes the Skrin. The Skrin are a force that helps keep the worlds separated. You might say they are guardians of the boundary between worlds. What if the wrong person got their hands on it? A person wishing to help the Keeper. She pulled on his shirt, urging him up. You worry too much, Richard. I have work to do. You must leave me to it now. Do your best, child, and study. Learn to touch your Han to get control of it. You must learn. 
if you are to be of any help to the Creator. Richard turned back to her. She was staring off. And why does the Keeper want the world of the living? What will it gain him? What is the purpose? Her answer came in a soft, distant voice. Death is the antithesis of life. The Keeper exists to consume the living. His hatred of life has no bounds. His hatred is as eternal as his prison of death. Chapter 62 Richard was in a world of his own as he headed for the stone bridge. He had been cloistered in his room for days, thinking. When the sisters came to give him his lessons, he put in only a half-hearted effort. He now feared he just might touch his Han. Warren was busy, day and night in the vaults, checking what Richard had told him and looking for more information. There had to be at least some truth to what the prelate had told him. Why else would the keeper not yet have used the gateway if he could? He needed to go for a walk. He felt as if his head were about to burst. He just wanted to be away from the palace for a while. Pasha suddenly appeared at his side. I've been looking for you. He stared ahead as he walked. Why? I just wanted to be with you. Well, I'm going for a walk in the country. She shrugged. I wouldn't mind a walk. May I come along? Richard looked over. She was in her wispy maroon dress, the one with the V-shaped neckline. The day was chilly. At least she had on a useful-looking violet cloak. She was wearing big gold loop earrings. Her belt matched her necklace with the same kind of gold medallions. She looked alluring in the outfit, but they weren't exactly hiking in the country clothes. Are you wearing those useless slippers? She held a foot out to show him her tooled leather boots. I had them made special, just so I could go for walks with you. Made special, he grumbled to himself. Richard remembered how hurt she had been that time he had told her that the blue dress didn't become her. He didn't want to hurt her feelings by sending her away. She was only trying to please him. Maybe he thought the company of a smiling face would do him good. Well, all right, then. I guess you can come along, as long as you don't think I'm going to entertain you in conversation. She grinned and took his arm. I'd be happy just to walk with you. At least having Pasha on his arm kept most of the women away from him as they passed through the city. The ones who did boldly approach earned a glare from Pasha. The ones who braved the glare earned something else, a touch of her Han. They yelped from the invisible pinch and made themselves scarce. Richard understood now why the palace was breeding wizards. They were trying to get one with additive and subtractive magic. And now they had one. They walked silently up into hills, bathed in the golden light of the late afternoon sun. Richard felt better out in the open, rocky hills overlooking the city. Though it was an illusion, he felt free. He suddenly wished Pasha weren't along. He hadn't come out to see Gratch in days. Gratch was probably frantic. He was at a loss as to what he was going to do next. He didn't know if everything the prelate had said was true, and he didn't know which he feared more, that it was a lie or the truth. Pasha's hand on his arm tightened in a way that brought him out of his brooding thoughts and made him draw to a halt. She glanced about nervously. He could tell by the way she was breathing through her mouth that she was frightened. What's wrong, he whispered. Her gaze searched the surrounding rocks. Richard, there is something out here. Please, let's go back. Richard drew the sword. Its unique ring filled the still afternoon air. He felt nothing, no sense of danger but Pasha's Han obviously felt something that frightened her. Pasha let out a little shriek. Richard spun. Gratch's head poked up above a rock. Pasha backed away. It's all right, he won't hurt you. Gratch gave a tentative grin, showing his fangs, as he stood to his full, towering height. Kill it, she screamed. It's a beast, kill it. Pasha, calm down, he won't hurt you. She backed farther away. Gratch stood looking from Richard to Pasha, not knowing what to do. Richard realized she might use her power to hurt the gar, so he put himself between the two. Richard, move! It must be killed! It's a beast! It won't hurt you. I know him, Pasha. She turned and ran, her violet cloak flying behind. Richard groaned as he watched her leap from the top of one rock to another, making her way down the hill. He scowled back at Gratch. What's wrong with you? Did you have to scare her? What are you doing showing your face to people? Gratch's ears wilted. His shoulders slumped, and he began to whine. When his wings started quivering, Richard went to him. Well, it's too late now to be sorry. Come on and give me a hug. Gratch cast his eyes to the ground. 
It'll be all right. He put his arms around the big furry creature. Gratch finally responded. He threw his arms and wings around Richard, gurgling his happiness. In a moment, he pulled Richard off the rock and wrestled him to the ground. Richard tickled his ribs and wrestled until Gratch was giggling in glee. After they had settled down, Gratch put a claw tip in the pocket where Richard kept the lock of Kalen's hair. He looked at Richard from under hooded eyebrows as big as axe handles. Richard finally figured out what Gratch meant. No, no, that's not the same woman. It's a different person. Gratch frowned. He didn't understand. Richard didn't feel like trying to explain that the lock of hair he was always looking at was not from Pasha. At Gratch's urging, Richard instead wrestled with his woolly friend. It was twilight when Richard made it back to the palace. He was going to have to find Pasha and explain to her that Gratch was his friend and not a dangerous beast. Before he had gone far, Sister Verna found him instead. Did you feed that baby gar back in the wilds, the one I told you to kill? Did you let that beast follow us? Richard stared at her. It was helpless, sister. I couldn't kill something that was no harm to me. We've become friends. Muttering, she wiped a hand across her face. As absurd as it sounds, I suppose I can understand. You needed companionship, and you certainly didn't want it from me. Sister Verna, but why would you let Pasha see it? I didn't. He just popped his head up. I didn't know he was there. Pasha saw him before I knew. She let out an exasperated sigh. The people around here fear beasts. They kill them. Pasha went screaming to the sisters that there was a beast in the hills. I'll explain it to them. I'll make them understand. Richard, listen to me. He backed away a step and stood silently while he waited for her to go on. The palace believes that pets are a hindrance to learning to use your Han. They believe it diverts feelings away from them to the creature. I think they are being foolish, but that is beside the point. What is the point? You mean they will try to keep me from seeing him anymore? She put an impatient hand on his arm. No, Richard. They think it's a vile beast that could turn on you. They think you are in danger. The sisters are forming a search party as we speak. They intend to hunt it down and kill it for your own good. Richard stared at her concerned expression for only a second, and then he was running. He charged over the bridge back into the city. People gaped as he flew past. He leapt over carts that wouldn't move out of the way fast enough. He knocked over a stand selling amulets. People hollered at him, but he ran on. His heart thumped in his ears as he raced up the hills. Several times he stumbled over ditches or rocks, but he rolled to his feet, gasping for air, and rushed on. In the darkness, he leapt from rock to rock as he crossed ravines. At the crest of a round-topped hill, near where he had been with Gratch earlier, he yelled between panting. His fists at his sides, he tipped his head back and screamed Gratch's name. His voice echoed off the surrounding hills. Only silence answered when the echoes died out. Exhausted, Richard fell to his knees. They would be coming soon. The sisters would use their Han to find the Gar. Gratch wouldn't know what they intended. Even if he kept his distance, their magic could reach out and kill him. They could knock him from the air or set him afire. Gratch! Gratch! A dark shape blackened a patch of stars. The gar thumped to the ground and folded his wings. He cocked his head and gave a purling gurgle. Richard grabbed Gratch's fur in his fists. Gratch, listen to me. You have to go away. You can't stay here any longer. They are coming to kill you. You must leave. Gratch let out a questioning whine that rose in pitch. His ears perked forward. He tried to put his arms around Richard. Richard pushed him away. Go! You understand me. I know you do. Go! I want you to go away. They will try to kill you. Go away and never come back. Gratch's ears wilted as he cocked his head to the other side. Richard pounded a fist to the gar's chest. He pointed north. Go away. He threw his arms out and pointed again. I want you to go away and never come back. Gratch tried to put his arms around Richard again. Richard pushed them away again. Gratch's ears lay down against his head. Gratch, lug, ratch, arg. Richard wanted more than anything to hold his friend and tell him that he loved him too, but he couldn't. He had to make him go in order to save his life. Well, I don't love you. Go away and never come back. Gratch looked to the hill Pasha had run down. He looked back at Richard. His green eyes were filling with tears. He reached out for Richard. 
Gratch shoved him away. Gratch stood with his arms out. Richard remembered the first time he had held the furry beast. He had been so little then. He was so big now. But as he had grown, his friendship and his love had grown too. He was Richard's only friend, and only Richard could save him. If Richard really loved him, he had to do this. Go away! I don't want you around anymore. I don't want you to ever come back. You're just a big dumb bag of fur. Go away. If you really love me, then you'll do as I ask and go away. Richard wanted to keep yelling, but the lump in his throat caught the words. He backed away. Gratch seemed to wither in the cool night air. His arms came out again with a pitiful, forlorn wail. He called with a plaintive, keening cry. Richard took another step back. Gratch took a step toward him. Richard picked up a rock and heaved it at the gar. It bounced off his huge chest. Go away, Richard cried. He threw another rock. I don't want you around anymore. Go away. I don't ever want to see you again. Tears ran from the glowing green eyes over the wrinkles of his cheeks. Gratch, lug, rotch, harg. If you really love me, then you will do this. Go. The gar looked again to the hill Pasha had run down, turned, and spread his wings. With a last look over his shoulder, he bounded into the air and flew off into the night. When he could no longer see the dark shape against the stars or hear the sweep of wings, Richard crumpled to the ground. His only friend was gone. I love you too, Gratch. He cried in racking sobs. Dear spirits, why have you done this to me? He was all I had. I hate you, every last one of you. He was halfway back when it hit him. He froze in his tracks, his mouth hanging open. In the stillness of the night, his shaking fingers reached to his pocket. The lights of the city flickered in the near distance. Rooftops shimmered in the moonlight. Distant sounds of the city drifted out to him at the edge of the hills. He pulled out the lock of Kalin's hair. If you really love me, she had said, you will do this. That was what he had told Gratch. In a flash of understanding, it all came to him. The jolt of comprehension took his breath. Kalin had not been sending him away. She had been saving his life. She had done for him what he had just done for Gratch. The pain of having doubted her took him to his knees. He must have broken her heart. How could he have doubted her? The collar. He had been so afraid of the collar, he had been blinded to it. She loved him. She didn't want to be set free. She wanted only to save his life. She loved him. He threw his arms open and turned his face up to the sky. She loves me. He knelt, staring at the lock of hair she had given him to remind him of her love. In his whole life, he had never felt a sense of relief this great. The world came back to life for him. Richard's mind swirled in a confusion of conflicting emotions. He felt heartsick that he had sent Gratch away, that Gratch thought Richard didn't want him around anymore. But at the same time, he felt overwhelming joy that Kalin loved him. In the end, joy won out. He decided that someday, Gratch might come to understand, as he had, that it had been necessary. Someday he would have the collar off and he would find Gratch and make it up to him. And even if he didn't, the gar was better off living as a gar should, hunting and searching out its own kind. It would come to have its own happiness, as had Richard. Although he wanted more than anything to throw his arms around Kalin, hug her tight and tell her how much he loved her, he couldn't. He was still a prisoner of the sisters, but he would study and learn and get the collar off. He would get the collar off and return to Kalin. He knew without a doubt that she would be waiting for him. She had said she would always love him. When he met the search party of sisters at the edge of Tanimura, he told them that they needn't bother, that they would find the beast gone. They didn't believe him and went on into the hills. Richard didn't care. Gratch was gone. His friend was safe. Richard bought a gold necklace from a street hawker. He didn't know if it was real gold, but he didn't care. It looked pretty. He trotted the rest of the way to the palace. Pasha was pacing up and down in the hall outside his room. Richard! Richard, I was so worried. I know that right now you're furious with me, but in time you will see that... He grinned. I'm not angry, Pasha. In fact, I brought you a present to thank you. She smiled in coy surprise as he offered her the necklace. For me? Why? Because of you, I figured out that she loves me and always has. I was just being a blind fool. You helped me see that. 
She regarded him with a frosty look. But you are here now, Richard. You will forget her in time. You'll see that I'm the one for you. He smiled happily at her. Pasha, I'm sorry. It's nothing against you. You're a beautiful young woman. In time, you'll find the one for you. You can have your pick of nearly any man. Everyone likes you. But I'm not the one for you. Maybe if I live to be a hundred, but short of that, her sly smile returned. Then I will wait. He kissed the top of her head before going to the door. He didn't think he would be able to sleep while he was this excited, but all the walking and running had left him exhausted. His last thoughts before he drifted off were of Kalin. He pictured her in his mind, as if she was there with him, her special smile, her deep green eyes, and her radiant long hair. He drifted into the best sleep he had had in months. In the days following, Richard felt as if his feet hardly touched the ground. Everyone was puzzled by his good mood. They frowned at him at first, but were eventually caught up in his cheer. Some of the sisters giggled when he told them they looked as beautiful as a sunny day. He urged the sisters who came to practice with him to try harder to help him reach his Han. He had them stay longer than usual. Sisters Tovey and Cecilia bubbled with enthusiasm. Marissa and Niki bestowed small smiles of pleasure. Armina was cautiously pleased, and Liliana delighted. He wanted his collar off, and until he could do what they wanted, he knew it would stay on. Having not seen Warren in a while, he finally went down to the vaults to see how his search was coming. Sister Becky was off retching, and the other sister giggled when he winked at her. Warren was pleasantly surprised to see him and exhilarated about some of the things he had found. He could hardly wait to tell Richard. When the door to one of the back rooms had grated closed, he started opening volumes on the table. What you told me has been a great help. Look here. Warren pointed at words Richard couldn't understand. Just like you told me. This says that the stone of tears being in this world in itself does not free the keeper. So what significance does it have? Well, it's as if there are a number of locks on his prison door, and this turns the key in one, but it does not free him. There are a number of ways for it to help him, a number of objects of magic to help, but the stone of tears itself must be used by one from this world, one with the gift for both additive and subtractive magic, to free the keeper. Those with only the gift for additive can cause harm, tear the veil more, but not free him with it. I think, Warren said with a twinkle, that we're safe with that black stone in this world as long as we're careful. It's not black. I never told you it was black. I just described the shape and size. Warren touched a finger to his lower lip. Not black? Then what color is it? Amber. Warren slapped his hands to his chest with a groan of relief. Thank the creator. He let out an uncharacteristic whoop. That's the best news I've heard all year. Amber means it was touched by a wizard's tears. That repulses the keeper. It's like rotten festering meat would be to us. His agents won't touch it. Richard's grin widened. It had to be Zed who had done it. That was why he felt Zed's pull from the stone. This, on top of his discovery about Kalim, was just too much. He couldn't keep the happiness to himself. Warren, I have other good news. I'm in love. I'm going to be wed. Warren gave another whoop, but then his smile wilted. It's not Pasha, is it? If it is, that's all right. I will understand. You two will make a handsome... Richard lightly touched Warren's shoulder. No, it's not Pasha. I'll tell you about her some other time. She's the mother confessor. I didn't mean to interrupt you. What about the other things? Well, he pulled another book across the table. There are precious few references to the round bone you spoke of and the scrin. One of them is in a forked prophecy having to do with the winter solstice coming up in a couple of weeks. It's a complicated juncture of forks and crossovers. We've only recently learned that the prophecy about that woman and her people is the descendant of a true fork. Whenever Warren went off on his talk of forks and junctures, Richard always started getting lost. About the only thing he understood was winter solstice. What does the winter solstice have to do with anything? Warren looked up. Winter solstice, the shortest day of the year. Shortest day, longest night. See what I mean? No. What does that have to do with the scrin? The longest night of the year, longest night, most darkness. You see... The keeper has certain times when he can exert greater or lesser influence in this world. His is the world of darkness, and when we are in the period of the longest darkness, the veil is at its weakest. That's when he is able to do the most harm. Then we're in danger in a few weeks, at winter solstice. 
Warren's eyebrows lifted in delight. Yes, but you've given me the information to solve an upcoming prophecy, along with what we now know to be the true fork involved along with it. You see, with this winter solstice, there is a prophecy about the danger to the world of the living. The keeper has to have a number of elements in place for it to be a true fork, such as an open gateway, but he needs an agent in this world. Warren leaned forward in delight, and he in turn needs the scrin. If he has the scrin bone you told me of, he can invoke the guardian and destroy it. If the guardian is destroyed, the keeper can come through the gateway. Warren, that sounds pretty frightening to me. Warren lifted his hand with a dismissive wave. No, no, many prophecies sound ominous like this one, but the elements are rarely all in place, so they turn out to be false forks, as most do. The books are clogged with false forks, because, Warren, get to the point. Oh, yes, well, you see, you told me that your friend has the bone that can invoke the scrin, and the keeper would need an agent, but he doesn't have one. Without the scrin bone, and with the upcoming fork, which we now know must be passed correctly, and we think it will, this is just another false fork, so we're safe. Richard felt a distant tingling of apprehension, but Warren's bubbly confidence overwhelmed it. He was caught up in Warren's enthusiasm. He gave the young man a clap on the back. Good work, Warren. Now I can concentrate on learning to use my Han. Warren beamed. Thank you, Richard. I'm so glad you've been able to help me. I've made more progress than I ever thought I would before I met you. Still grinning, Richard shook his head in wonder. Warren, I've never met anyone that was so smart yet so young. Warren laughed as if that was the funniest thing he had ever heard. What's so funny? Your joke, Warren said, wiping tears from his eyes. What joke? Warren's laughter slowed to a frowning chuckle. About me being young, it was funny. Richard held his polite smile. Warren, why is that funny? Warren's chuckle died down to a grin. Because I'm 157 years old. Richard's flesh prickled. Now you're making a joke. That's a joke. It is a joke, Warren, isn't it? Warren's good humor evaporated. He blinked. Richard, you do know, don't you? They must have told you. I was sure they would have told you by now. Richard's arms swept the books aside. He scooted his chair closer. Told me what? Warren, don't you say something like that and then go silent on me. You're my friend. You tell me. Warren cleared his throat and then wet his lips with his tongue. He leaned in a little. Richard, I'm sorry. I thought you knew. Or I would have told you myself a long time ago. I would have. Told me what? The magic. The magic of the Palace of the Prophets. It has additive and subtractive elements to it that are tied to the other worlds. That makes time move differently here. Warren... Richard said hoarsely. Do you mean it affects all of us? All those wearing the collar? No, everyone at the palace. The sisters, too. This place is spelled. As long as the sisters live at the palace, they age the same as we do. The spell makes us age more slowly, makes time seem different to us. What do you mean, different? The spell slows our aging process. For every year we age, those outside age between 10 and 15 years. Richard's head was spinning. Warren, that can't be true. It can't. He tried desperately to think of proof. Pasha. Pasha could only be... Richard, I've known Pasha for over a hundred years. Richard slid the chair back and stood. He raked his fingers through his hair. That doesn't make any sense. It has to be some kind of... Why would it work like that? Warren took Richard's arm and sat him down. He pulled his own chair close. He spoke in a soft, concerned voice, as one would when breaking calamitous news to a someone. It takes a long time to train a wizard. Outside in the rest of the world, over 20 years had gone by before I was even able to touch my Han. But because I live here, I had aged less than two years. 20 years had passed here, too, but I aged only two. If the palace did not slow our aging, we would all die of old age before we could even light a lamp with our Han. I have never heard of it taking less than 200 years to train a wizard. Commonly, it takes near to 300, and sometimes even as much as 400. The wizards who created this place knew that, and so they tied the magic here to the worlds beyond where time is meaningless. I don't know how it works, just that it does. Richard's hands shook. But I have to get this collar off. I have to get to Kalen. I can't wait that long. Warren, help me. I can't wait that long. Warren glanced to the floor. I'm sorry, Richard. I don't know how to get our collars off, and I don't know how to get by the barrier that keeps us here. 
I know how you feel, though. It drove me into the vaults for the last 50 years. Some of the others don't seem to care and say that it just gives them more time with women. Richard slowly rose. I can't believe it. 